Um, but I'm gonna get started because it's 707, which is the number of the house that I grew up in. <laughs> so I find it to be a lucky number. Anyway, um, welcome everybody. I'm so excited for this. Uh, you are amongst, although you all don't know each other, some of you might know one or two of you, but you are amongst an amazing group of women, which I love. Um, we do have guys sometimes, but there are no guys here today. Uh, but I love when guys are part of it because it's such, they are so aware and they add such value when it just, it's just really fun when guys are part of it. But anyway, it's all ladies today. Um, Michelle's husband was going to be a part of it, right, Michelle? But he's, I don't think he's doing it right this minute, but he's going to watch it later, but he's emotionally intelligent. <laughs> um, so what I would love and why I would love this um, is whenever I do emotional intelligence trainings, what I know to be true is everybody is like-minded in the dedication to their growth. And while people might be at different stages, they're still at the level in which they all wanna be the best version of themselves. And so um, what happens in all of my groups as we do courses, people become friends. And it's awesome because it's really, one of the first things I advise is when you become emotionally intelligent and you learn this work, that you don't go back and ask advice from people who haven't done work like this. Because, I'm not saying that they're bad people, but they're often giving advice from an emotionally unintelligent place. Hi, Lori, you found it. Um, they're often giving advice from an emotionally unintelligent place. And, and I'll give you an example. We all have girlfriends where we complain about our husband or our friend or our sister or somebody. And they're like, yeah, girl, you're right. Even if you're not right, they want to tell you you're right because they want to be your friend and want to seem supportive and that's all that they know. I personally want people in my life that might say to me, you know, Jen, I think you're being irrational. You know, Jen, there might have been a better way to handle that. And so we want to be surrounded by people that are emotionally intelligent to give us advice. So whenever I do these groups, women become friends or people in the groups, even when it's not all women, become friends because they're sharing this like-mindedness. And what happens, what's really cool too, is they wind up using each other as sounding boards as a resource to go outside of maybe their their interconnected circle that they normally go to to say hey I would love your advice on something and the person on the other side loves to give it because they want to practice their emotional intelligence skills they want to practice their emotional intelligence teaching because what happens in I'd say 98% of the time when people take this course they in some way shape or form become so all I don't want to say obsessed in a negative way, but obsessed with wanting more and more and more. And many of them will turn around and start teaching it, whether they teach it, full on teach it, which a lot of my students have, or they just teach it in some way in their life. They usually take it and want to be teachers of it because it's so transformative. So with that, I would love if everybody would just give like a 30 second introduction of yourself and i'll call your name so that it doesn't get crazy and confusing um just state why um so who you are where you're from because people are from all over here um and why you are interested in learning more about emotional intelligence now just to preface i know some people on here have been training um in it for years so say that i've been learning this for years and i keep diving deeper and and before i go any further with that I want to say what's fascinating about this content is you can hear the same exact content and you're learning something different every time because you become a different person. And when you think about that for a second, you could hear the same exact content from me and because you become a different person each time you hear it, you hear something different. And that's what's fascinating. You know, in like a history class, you hear that history lesson once and you're over it, you've, you've learned it. This content is not like that at all. 
And, um, and that's what's amazing about it. It's kind of like, how many of you have ever heard of the book Think and Grow Rich? So Think and Grow Rich is a legendary book that most often when successful people have to give their top three books that transform their lives, Think and Grow Rich is one of them. What also is interesting is most people that have read Think and Grow Rich and have become successful and say that that was a book that they've read, they'll say that they've read it multiple times in their lives because each time they read it, they're a different person. So they're learning something new from it. And what I've also learned is that most people, when they start a training like this, are trying to appease their number one pain point first. Maybe someone's going through a breakup. Maybe someone's dealing with family drama. Maybe someone is stuck in life in general and wants to get clarity. Maybe someone's stuck financially, and wants to get over a hump. So everybody listens for their pain point first. So when they do it again later or listen to the same content later, they might be over that pain point and now they're focused on another pain point. Or maybe it's not a pain point, but it's something they want to improve upon. So they're hearing it different. So maybe it was about money the first time. Maybe now it's about relationships. So what I'm saying is even if it's the same exact thing, you're hearing it differently, which is so cool when you really think about it. So with that said, I would love, um, I'm going to call each person and just unmute yourself. It doesn't have to be stressful at all. Just your name, where you're from, um, and why you think it's important um, to learn this content. Uh, Michelle, you're the first person in my lineup here, so you can go first. So, Carnahan or Vitar? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Better. Okay. I'm Michelle Vitar. I'm from Parsippany, New Jersey. And um, this is a topic of interest for me because I would say that I've avoided this topic despite knowing the importance of it. I've had the book Emotional Intelligence 2.0, started reading a couple pages, put it down, and um, I could really benefit from executing, but first of all, learning more about the principles. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to put you on the hot spot for a second. Thank you for that vulnerability. Thanks. Can you say why you think you've been avoiding it? And I ask you this because that's a common thing because it's something you know most people know that they want to do but then there's a reason that resistance exists well to be honest i think i have most of the answers and um i have to recognize that those answers work for me but not necessarily everyone else um, but it's really a matter of convenience to just operate under my own assumptions my own feelings and then realize after the fact that, you know, maybe I said something the wrong way or made someone else feel a certain way. Um, so it's definitely not what I want, especially with relationships that are meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that. Well, that was emotionally intelligent in and of itself, by the way. Um, Cause that's basically saying, I want to own responsibility more. And it's easier sometimes if we don't know what we don't know, that we can just say, oh, I didn't know. But if we know all this stuff, we really do have to own it more, um, which is really awesome, but also takes a new level of responsibility in life. Um, and so I appreciate your sharing that because that was extremely vulnerable. Um, and also, I did, now I will remember forever, but hard, not better. <laughs> All good. <laughs> All right, Deborah, you're up next. So hi, I'm Deborah. I live in Westchester. Um, I recently left my full-time job to coach full-time. Um, so I'm taking this not only to help myself, but then to be able to serve my clients better. Um, so not only is my married last name Italian, my maiden name is Italian. I'm a complete hothead. Uh, so um, the more I can learn to um, rein my emotions in and um, handle them better and relay them in a way that's uh, more appropriate is better for everyone. Um, so another emotionally intelligent awareness right there, calling yourself out. Uh, and what I say is your default status is hothead, right? Because that's what you were programmed with uh, when you were younger. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, my mom was 
old school Italian screamer with like on the wall behind her chair in the kitchen was about 10 different wooden spoons with all different sizes, depending on how bad you are. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I get it. Um, and, and so much of my default status could be that too, if I didn't do so much of this work. Um, and there's times where I'll feel that emotional state, but I have the tools to process it differently. Um, so I appreciate that vulnerability. And you're doing meditation classes now too, right? Have I seen you doing? Yeah. Okay, cool. I love it. Yeah, I've been meditating um, inconsistently from 2012 to 2017 and from 2017 until today. It's like 651 days in a row. Oh my God, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So that's um, helped me immensely. We are going to be talking about meditation and the importance of it in emotional intelligence. Uh, so... Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to like, let you shine during that time period. You were not prepared for this. Everyone knows she was not prepared for this, but I am going to let you jump in during that time period to share okay. how it's helped you and why it's helped you because it's so important. And, um, a lot of people feel like they just don't have time for it. And I feel like the busier you are, the more time you need for it. Um, so thank you for sharing. Sure, thank you. Um, all right. We are going up to, uh, Lori next. Hi guys, good, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Lori Goldberg. Um, I'm from Chasford, Pennsylvania area. And um, really I've been just, Jen and I knew each other from high school, so I've been following her Facebook forever. And all the emotional intelligence posts that you do really just like prompted me to like kind of internalize and think about myself and how I react to things. Um, so right now, um, potentially going through um, a career move. My job is relocating to Tampa, Florida, which doesn't sound horrible, especially in this weather right now. But um, I, I want to use this as an opportunity to learn more about myself and how I can um, have more meaningful relationships and conversations. Uh, like Deborah and Jen, I grew up in an Italian family. Um, and um, hothead, emotional, you know, sporadic thoughts coming out of the top of your head and things like that. I've been learning how to reel it in a lot and almost, I think, to the opposite. Where I'm not getting out what I need to get out in, a, in, the, in the right way. So I want to work on that. Um, are you moving to Tampa? I haven't decided yet. But if I take the job, I will probably just commute back and forth. All right. But no well, way is Mike going to move. <laughs> yeah, well... Yeah. Listen, it's not a bad, it's not a bad career. It's not, not, much, a bad, not a bad problem to have, right? Not much further than a train ride to DC if you really break it down. And the weather on the other side is way better. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so thank you for sharing that. And, and I appreciate everyone's vulnerability in it. And you'll notice when other people are sharing their stuff, then everyone shares their stuff. And that's why I wish everyone in life was a lot more transparent because no one's perfect. By the way, in emotional intelligence, when people become more masterful of it, they're not perfect. They still make mistakes. I still make mistakes. Um, it's a path of, uh, not perfection, but a path of consciousness so that you can just course correct faster. So I might make a mistake, but then I can go back and say sorry, or I can go back and reflect on what I did where People that are not emotionally intelligent and unaware just kind of leave their damage behind. Uh, people that are emotionally intelligent say, okay, I, I did mess up, I'm not perfect. However, let's make it right. Or if that happens again, here's how I'm gonna handle it better. Um, and so that's what the, the, the mastery level of this is not perfection, but just learning how to course correct faster. So I'm gonna mess up I, I, I'm probably going to pronounce your name wrong, but how I say it to myself is Raya. <laughs> Unmute. Um, hi guys. So my name is Ria. Um, uh, but I met Jen at a women's conference in Houston. I think it was like two years ago, mm -hmm. and um, yes. it's really excited too. And I I remember telling her that you know I wanted to start a blog and all of that. And what happened is. This emotional intelligence is interesting to me because 
Um, my family and I come from a lot of trauma um, from like 10 years of abuse. I lost my dad when I was 11. And so um, I really had to like shift from like being a victim to like taking control of my life. And that taking control is, you know, something that happened over time. But I started a blog called Resilience with Rhea. And I want to help people rebuild from trauma and really to know that um, that they can rebuild from it and they can um, better their lives and make that shift and take control. So that's why I want to be in this training. <laughs> and you're such a fascinating story that I'm going to like maybe put you on the spot to share more <laughs> of. It's very inspirational. Uh, and when we connected at the event in Houston, I was just enamored with the things that that you have overcome and the lessons that can inspire people from it. So well, thank you, Jen. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I remember that moment in that bar. I don't know the name of that bar and it wasn't wild and crazy when I say bar. It was like an after cocktail party <laughs> in, in Houston, um, but it was fun. It was great. Yeah. Um, all right. So next up is Marissa. Thank you, Rhea. You're good. <laughs> and everyone, oh, sorry. Hello. I can hear you. Okay. Can you see me? I can. Okay, cool. Um, so I am Marissa Takirian and I live in Philadelphia. I am not Italian. I'm Armenian, um, <laughs> but I'm just as crazy as everyone else. Um, um, so my, I'm, I'm one of, I'm an only girl, but I have brothers and one of the only girls out of a lot of the cousins, like immediate cousins. Um, I met Jen at Alves. I think it was two summers ago, but ironically, we had a bunch of friends in common and we were like, how do we not know each other? Um, and soon later, you know, as I became Facebook friends and I was following a lot of her posts and I had really that same year started a journey in my own head that I wanted to become, you know, a better version of myself. And, um, I felt like in the last over my entire life, I've always been the person that gives to everyone else, but never really took care of me. And I'm, I'm blessed. I'm, I went to college here and high school here, and I have a lot of great friends. But it was that when everyone else was going through all of their issues, divorces, or this, that, and the other that comes into life, I just made sure everyone was good, but I never got myself in a solid place as far as relationships or um, I think just really taking care of me. So I really chose to, you know, do that in the last couple of years. And then Ironically, right before this workshop, um, I signed up for this workshop, and then my dad passed away on December 11th, and um, I feel like it was a weird sign that I did this because I feel like this workshop is going to help me not only with the loss of my father, but maybe in my relationships, hopefully with relationships, and learning how to cope with this trauma that just happened to me, but also learning how to be better in relationships with men and putting myself in a better, I'm trying to use the right word, but not better environment, but make better decisions maybe. So if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. A place of vulnerability as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So I thank you for sharing that because I know that was very vulnerable for you and raw still. So thank you. Um, and emotional intelligence is all about healing. It's learning how to heal, not just yourself, but to help heal other people. Um, what most people don't realize is in every encounter we have with people, we have an opportunity to hurt them or heal them. Crazy when you think about it that way. You, mm -hmm. So your encounter with somebody can leave them better or leave them worse. And often there's very, I'm not often, very few times is there a neutral. So I say to Anyone I teach that um, most people go through life like an adult pinata game. You know, in a pinata game, you have a blindfold on and you have a bat in your hand and you're swinging trying to hit the pinata. That's what most people are going through life doing. And they're hitting people along the way. And they don't even realize they're hitting people, but they're hitting people because they're blindfolded. Mm -hmm. And that's how most people go through life. And so they wind up hurting people constantly along the way, not meaning to, just completely unawake and unaware. And so emotional intelligence teaches you how to not do that, to either leave a place neutral, like nothing happened, or healed. 
but not leaving it worse off than, than you found it, um, a person or a situation for that matter. Um, so it is, there's so many healing components to it. Marissa, before I forget, I don't know if I told you this when we were texting, um, there's a book called Conversations with God. Have you ever read it? Yet? No, but I'm going to put in my notes. That was one of the books uh, that after my mom passed away mm -hmm. was most comforting to me. Um, Conversations with God and Sacred Contracts. Read Conversations with God first. Book number one, the subtitle is An Uncommon Dialogue. It's white. There's like 10 books in the series, but you want to read the first mm -hmm. one first. Uncommon Dialogue. Okay. And what was the second one again? Sacred Contracts. Okay. It's really deep, but it's really powerful. It really goes into the belief system that before we entered this world, we made a contract. Each time our soul evolves, we make a contract of what we're supposed to learn. And then sometimes we're not meant to be here as long as other people because that contract was a shorter contract. And so, at least for me, it gives peace to an understanding of why everyone has a different journey. Um, and, and, and it gives me respect to why people's journeys might be different, even if I can't understand it. Um, it's, it's by this woman, Carolyn Miss, M-Y-S-S. -S. All of her work is really deep, um, but it's very nourishing when you're um, thank, thank you. you. Um, all right, next up is Michelle, the second Michelle. Not, not actually second, but <laughs> next. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm from Vacaville, California. I've been here for 21 years. And the reason why, I should say reasons why I wanted to take this course, uh, gosh, I have so many. I'm going to list, list like my top three. Um, so last year I started on this journey um, of just learning a lot more about, just immersing myself more into positive mindset and higher frequency and all those things. And then I met Jen at um, a training seminar that my uh, one of my business partners had led, um, and it just feels like it's it's helped so much in my personal life, and it's also now helping me in coaching my team with what I'm doing um, in direct sales. Um, and I just feel like the more I learn and the more I benefit from it, the more I want to share it with other people. Um, I've had a lot of personal growth and development. I have had, in the last year, um, I had a, a loss of a friendship. And while that sounds sad, it was actually a good thing. But I, I, I wouldn't have seen all of the red flags. Um, I didn't see all the red flags for the longest, the longest time um, until I started really immersing myself into this topic um, of this other person that was actually jealous, which is, uh, really sad because I didn't understand that. I don't come from that place. Um, but it resulted in a loss of a friendship. But in the meantime, it opened the door for so many other positive relationships. Um, so those are some of the reasons why I needed more of this. I love it. So you, see what I've said? Once you start, you just want more. This, yeah. is, this is the typical experience for somebody is like, wow. That was just so transformative. And now I'm becoming a better mom, a better spouse, a better sister, a better just being. And, and then you realize there's so much that you don't know. Um, and it just becomes this really cool scavenger hunt of more nuggets of wisdom to your own identity, which is awesome. It's helped with my marriage too. I've been married for 21 years and uh, we've had our, our ups and downs, share of ups and downs. And it seems like in the past year, I've had more compassion instead of thinking, gosh, he, he's such an idiot. Why does he say that? Or why does he X, Y, and Z? Or, you know, why is he so negative? It helps me deal with him in a more compassionate way of, you know, gosh, that's really sad that he feels that way about himself, that he has to, you know, try to bring me down or what have you. So um, it's taught me a lot of patience too, mm -hmm. a lot more awareness. So. Yeah. That's to get me more of that. <laughs> it is really cool. Giving someone, understanding someone else's playbook, which we'll talk about a lot tonight, is really powerful. Uh, what's funny is when I go into corporations, I'm going in 
being paid by an executive to make you know the sales team's numbers rise or to make a team function better and just have more harmony and um, one of the top things I hear out of it is what you just said people will come to me on the side and be like I that totally improved my marriage that that is like the, one of the that's the top thing and the second to it is that made me a better parent uh, so those are the top two things and and it's great because they're like, oh, this is awesome. Our company just paid for this, but my whole life at home is benefiting from it, which is why I say you can't separate your work life and personal life. They're all interconnected. They're all intertwined. And we can't be robots because we're not robots. So um, so thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Um, I am going to, Kim, you're going last because you're the longest student so far. So I'm saving you for last, okay? Um, Next up is Elise. Hello, everyone. Jen, you look beautiful tonight, as do all the other ladies. Thank you. I went to, I tested my camera yesterday. It was working just fine. And today it's not working. So um, I love emotional intelligence because it is friggin' awesome. It is so transformative. And as you were saying, when you opened up um, your meeting, is people around you who aren't emotional intelligent try to give you advice, and you're like, really? <laughs> um, and so it's very transformative. And the number one reason why I have so much passion for it is because I have a son, and I need to ensure that this boy grows up into a man who understands emotions, knows how to manage them, knows how to handle relationships. And he can't learn that unless his mother is emotionally intelligent. Mm -hmm. So that is my number one parental objective. And I really feel like through our thoughts and emotions is how we discover who we really are. That is self-awareness. We learn who we are mostly through negative emotions. And when we can recognize what fear it's based off of, then we can work to overcome it. For example, jealousy, our thoughts become feelings, right? We know that. So if you're feeling je jealousy, I mean, I have this monologue with myself all the time. Okay, what is this you're feeling? Jealousy and it's making you feel insecure. And it usually comes from judgment, right? We judge ourselves and then we um, get into the feeling. And then um, I get to the core of what fear that is, non-acceptance, judgment, that, that I'm not enough. And then I come to my senses and say, you're badass, girl. <laughs> get that, over this, this is ridiculous. That's her so, business I, brand right there. <laughs> so I wouldn't, I mean, you just can't live authentically. You can't live vulnerably. You know, you could, vulnerability is so sexy. When a woman is who she is, or anybody who, who can just be themselves without fear of judgment is badass to me. I just admire that so much. Yeah. So those are the reasons why it's so important to me. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a minority. Um, but as we get... I think most people, as they get older, they can stop worrying about that. And I know a lot of women, when they turn 40, that's like the biggest thing they say is that they stopped caring about that stuff. Um, I just wish people didn't have to wait till they're 40 to actually stop caring. It doesn't always happen. I mean, <laughs> perspective wisdom takes openness. If you're not willing to be open to it, you're not going to evolve. And so many people around me are like that. They're just not open to it. They're so stuck. Yeah. They're stuck. I mean, I love negative feelings. I go into experiences because, it, uh, well, regardless of the consequence, mm -hmm. if it's going to be, if I'm rejected, all right, that's fine. That's cool. It's not, I don't take that personally. Yeah. And so um, I don't mind the negative emotions. I have teenagers. The last couple days, I've dropped them off and cried for 10 minutes. And that's when I figured stuff out of, right. you know, what your intentions are and what action I'm going to take. So it, it really is the key to living a badass life. It really yeah. is. 
Well, Lise just made a really good point that it's often in the moments of pain that we actually learn the most. And most people, unfortunately, live their lives trying to avoid pain mm -hmm. and negative emotions. Therefore, yeah. their growth is minimized. And as much as it stinks when you're sitting in a moment of pain, we there's always a time, and the more emotionally intelligent one is, can say, okay, this really sucks right now. But I know that there are many lessons being learned at this moment. I might not see the other side of the mountain yet, but I'm definitely going to evolve from this. And when you can approach it with that mindset, even things that stink are valuable anyway. So they don't stink as bad, which is awesome. Yeah, you explore it. Yeah. Exploration, yeah, and, to, and figure it out. Exactly. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elise. I appreciate it. Um, we have three more that are on here right now that we'll get through quickly. Um, next up is Amy Smith. I don't know why I always need to say your name together. People say my name together too, Jen Groover, like all the time. And I, I, every time I see your name, I'm like, Amy Smith. Oh, wait, you're still muted. Hold on. Okay, you're unmuted. All right. It's not even a phenomenal name either, Smith. It's such a boring name. <laughs> I apologize. My, <laughs> my, um, my video hasn't been on because my, I'm putting my girls to bed and they're having a party in their room. Yeah. So I've had to go back and forth a few times. So I, I missed the question. I don't, I'm not sure what the question was. So um, the question was, who are you? Where are you from? And what you want to get the most out of this? So like what made you want to do uh, more emotional intelligence training? So I'm Amy. Um, I live in Toronto. Um, and I, I've heard a, a few stories. Um, and very much like you guys, I'm a mother and I'm raising two daughters, twins like Jen, mm -hmm. um, identical girls, and just I feel that it's just so important that I, you know, set them on the right path that I give them the guidance that I, you know, I want to see them setting themselves up properly. I want to, you know, give them a good start in life. And I took Jen's course a while ago and I think it was for business. Mm -hmm. And then something clicked for me that was just like, this is more for my family. And I think for me, I'm a very, like, I'm incredibly shy. I, you know, I have big goals of what I want to do in my career, in my life, but I feel like relationship and family stuff needs to get worked on before I can even start to think about being a successful person. And I think that starts at home for me. Um, and just wanting to empower my girls to be like incredible humans. I remember Jen telling this story of your daughters in class. There was someone being bullied mm -hmm. and your girls didn't get upset at that bully. They mm -hmm. were compassionate for the person that was bullying someone, which I thought was pretty phenomenal. And I had never looked at anything like that before. And I felt that that was really inspiring and really made me want to delve deeper into what emotional intelligence is because I had never heard a story like that before, but I thought it was beautiful. And I think it's inspiring to teach our children something like that. So I, I want to learn more about emotional intelligence for my children, but also for myself and my success of my business. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. And I'll share that story with you all tonight in case you're curious what, does, what the story is. Um, but it was um, a story where they, kids are born, we're all born emotionally intelligent. It's actually through projections of fears and judgments from adults around us and then eventually peers that we become hurt and jaded and guarded and then we become less emotionally intelligent and so we decide to become more emotionally intelligent again um, so if we could teach this when kids are young and teach them how to process their feelings and uh, not take on other people's stuff we wouldn't have to be doing all this unwinding when we're older and i wish and i'm a huge advocate and proponent of getting in school systems um, it's just it's a longer process. We're actually making a lot more headway in private schools and academies uh, because they don't have as many rules to go by. It's a long, 
road ahead of us still for public schools. Um, but there's still progress being made, which is awesome. Um, all right, so there was somebody else here that I saw. That I know I have Kim left. I'm missing somebody. Uh, Amy, somebody else is here. All right, Kim, where are you? You're not even at your camera. I'm saving Kim for last because Kim's been doing this the longest and I knew she had the most wisdom to share. All right, well, we'll come back to Kim. Um, oh, Kim, oh, there you are. Kim, you're up. Kim? Hello, ladies, how are y'all? I'm Kim Dennis, I'm about maybe 20 miles north of Atlanta, Georgia. I have um, been doing emotional intelligence my whole life. Never really knew the name for it. So I met Jen through Facebook back in 09, 10, and got really involved with her in emotional intelligence the last three or four years. Ooh, hold on. <laughs> the bark. <laughs> um, back in '09, I lost a uh, pretty three level businesses in my business. Three markets totally crashed. All my stuff still sitting in storage. I live at my mother's. Uh, my son lost his daddy in 2013. He's 25 now. Got mixed up with the wrong crowd and got on drugs. Took me about I say two years to get him to talk better, uh, to dismantle that out of his life. He's got a killer job. Um, and his goals this year is to buy a house, find him a girlfriend. And I'm not real sure how that will work because I've been single since he was three years old. I put up with the abuse, the emotional abuse, the Somewhat physical, and that's when I threw his stuff to the curb, and I didn't look back. So this year, I'm wanting to be able to incorporate what I've learned in this emotional intelligence and build on what I already knew, replace what I don't need, and go out and teach other women the same thing. Words are very powerful, and if we plan them right, and I heard one of the ladies say that, she wanted her children to be able to have the emotional intelligence to process what they need to process on their journey. And if you need any advice, ask me and I'll tell you. <laughs> it might not be what you're actually needing, but down the road, you will need it. So, and I'm wanting to do some courses, but how you do that, I have no idea. And I'm glad you posted that post you did about that lady and man. And I'm not sure the price tag on that, but to take what I've already accumulated and make a course out of it is what I want to do this year. That's why I asked her to post it. For those who, who um, want to know what she's talking about, there's another emotional intelligence mastermind, which is filled with women who have done the trainings um, most uh, a couple of times, uh, that one of the women in the group, uh, she she basically shut her brick and mortar business down and was excited but scared and wound up pulling together this course that when she started working uh, in the first emotional intelligence session, she was really stuck and she had no real sense of clarity. And then she got clarity through the course. And then now she started this new uh, course of her own and wound up having 24 paid um, students. And it was a huge leap for her and she was really unsure and scared and and her leap was really inspiring for other people including Kim so thanks for sharing that Kim. Um, Another thing with this is um, I have been stuck and I know it's been in my mind because when I've just totally let go my phone rings off the hook then I get off of it and my shift shifts and I go right back to that main date where nothing's happening. Yeah. And, I want to break that cycle. This has been almost 10 years, and it's definitely got to go out the door. Some way, some form, some fashion. Yeah. I want it gone. 
So what Kim just addressed, I'm going to dive into tonight. Um, when she said, when I let go, the phone rings off the hook. And when I stress, um, things don't go the way she wants. And so what she's talking about is quantum physics. It's energy. It's frequency, as I'll address it a lot tonight. And it's true. So I want you all to think about when you were younger, or even for some of you right now, too, when you're in the dating world and you don't care, you just don't care. You know, maybe before you met your spouse, you're in the state where you didn't care. And then that's when you meet them because you just didn't care. But then when you care and all the pressure is there, you're like, oh my God, my clock's ticking. Oh my God, I want to. Then all of a sudden it creates a different energy where you're either attracting the wrong people or not attracting anyone to that point because the energy is different. So what Kim's talking about is the, the, the frequency of faith. And it doesn't even, could be in a religious context or not. I'm saying it in a spiritual context, but um, the frequency of faith. And, and when you're emotionally intelligent, you have a lot more faith. You try to control things a lot less and you allow things a lot more. So another thing I'll talk about tonight is living life through force versus flow. For a long time, I forced things to happen and things can happen when you force them. It's really freaking exhausting. Um, mm. Or you can have more faith and allow things to flow. And when things flow, your life feels way more at ease. You're less exhausted. When I was forcing everything, I was exhausted all the time. And, and I'm a high energy person, so it takes a lot to exhaust me all the time. Um, and so um, when we learn to become more emotionally intelligent, we allow things to happen a lot more than we force things. And when things don't go our way, we don't get as upset. We actually realize that it's probably a gift. So um, Marissa asked a question that I'm going to address, and then we're going to dive like deep, deep, deep. I, I love the introductions, and I appreciate everyone's vulnerability. Um, uh, if you're resonating with each other, definitely connect on, on Facebook and stay connected in the group. Um, as you could see, when all of you spoke, there was still an opportunity to learn. There was a lot of nuggets of, of, of wisdom that were coming from each person's introduction. Everything is an opportunity to learn. Every experience that you have is an opportunity to learn. And every time you approach life like that, you will find so much more wisdom. Um, my favorite is when I have clients that hire me to teach them, and then they tell me how to teach them. And I think it's hilarious because like, you hired me to teach you. So if you already know the answers, you don't need me. And, and so this is something that's a conditioning of life where people come to like a class like this and expect a certain me to just be like spilling off information right now. How many of you, you don't have to answer, how many of you realize the introductions was actually part of the process of learning too. Um, and, and each introduction, uh, my intention is to extract emotional intelligence information to teach you back. Um, so those of you who do want to, who are teaching it yourself or, or want to teach it, uh, usually when we're in places where we're meant to introduce ourselves, it can be really uncomfortable. And I'm not like that shy. And it can be really uncomfortable. What makes it comfortable is when the person leading the meeting, so if this is you leading the meeting, that you take what the person introduced themselves and then you take information out to turn it around so it supports the speaker and then it um, gives advice to the listeners so each introduction feels very valuable in one way, shape, or form. And that's what a skilled leader does. So this is advice that I learned earlier on in my life that. Um, I feel is extremely valuable. Um, so uh, Marissa's question was, how did I get involved in this career path and, and to tell you my journey? And so I'm going to tell you a lot of my journey throughout, but real like short version is I had a really dysfunctional childhood, very abusive childhood. Um, my dad was a functioning alcoholic. Um, my mom was from Brooklyn, New York who grew up in actually a, a wonderful childhood. Um, she loved her dad was like her life and um, she had brothers and sister, a brother and a sister. 
Vince Lombardi, who you guys have all probably heard of, was my uncle, which was my mom's greatest uh, influence other than her dad. Uh, and she came to Philadelphia to do a photo shoot. She was one of the first models for Seventeen magazine. Uh, she came to Philadelphia for a photo shoot. She had really, really kinky, curly hair. She was very ethnic Italian, can you tell? <laughs> I obviously did not get her direct genes. Um, but she was, her hair was very kinky, curly, and um, they had straightening had just come out it was in the late 60s, and they straightened her hair for the photo shoot, and it all fell out. So she was full on bald when she met my dad, who happened to be the attorney in the DA's office that was representing her in this case of losing her hair. So when she met my dad, my dad was an incredibly charismatic man. Um, he was a highly functioning alcoholic. So it was a long time into the relationship where she'd already fallen in love with him. Uh, that she realized he was an alcoholic, um, that he was an abusive alcoholic, and she wound up um, then, and I think all of us can resonate in one way, shape, or form in, a re in some sort of relationship in our lives, trying to get him to be back to the person that she fell in love with, um, and hoping that that's who he really was versus who he really was. And so my mom spent the rest of her life, for the most part, uh, trying to get his love and approval. Um, for a long time, he was a raging alcoholic, uh, where one of my first childhood memories was my dad throwing my mom down a flight of stairs into the basement. Um, her head hit a concrete basement floor and blood began spewing all over the floor. Um, my brother and I, were at the top of the stairs my dad locked the door and we could only see like under the crack of the the door and um pretty much thought our mom was going to die and um, she was screaming for help and luckily she taught my brother if something bad happens to me to dial zero and back then zero was no, there was no 911 and so he dialed zero and somehow four years of age four years of age remembered our address um, I was three at the time. And so that was the beginning of many traumatic childhood experiences. Uh, so when I went to college, I studied psychology, as most people with crazy childhoods do. It's just a thing. Um, and, and wanted to really figure out the psychology of why people do what they do and how to make sense of my childhood. And I always had really good self preservation skills, innate self-preservation skills. My brother, who was only 11 months older than me, did not. And it's actually really fascinating from a psychological case study. He's 11 months older than me. We grew up the same time period. And he became a very different human being. He became the victim story. And I became the non-victim story. And it's literally a case study right there. Um, luckily, at this stage of his life, uh, at 46, um, in the last two years, he met a woman that has helped heal him. Um, and God bless her, the patience that she has needed to do that. Um, but he's become a healthier, more whole human being. Um, so because of my dysfunction in my childhood and because of the trauma and pain that I had been through, there was this instinct in me to always be compassionate to people, to always want to help people. I always felt bad for the kid that was left out. I always, I never got too much into clicks. I was always friends with everybody. Um, and I just wanted to heal hurt people because I knew what it felt like to feel hurt and outcasted and like you're putting a persona on for who you are for your life. So a lot of people that I went to school with would never have known my childhood was what it was because I pretended it was and I pretended I was just like everybody else. Um, and so right out of college, I went to the fitness industry, which is motivating people in their personal growth, uh, taking my psychology and then my nutrition background and my physiology background. And when I was training people, physical fitness training, I was not caring as much as their physical fitness, as much as their emotional fitness, but I didn't have that terminology back then. And um, 
And I just loved inspiring people. And I loved watching people find their greatness. And I loved magnifying it for them. And I think because of all the trauma I had as a child, I find myself to be a very in, highly instinctful person. I am very intuitive. I read situations very quickly. Um, I read energy, feel energy, um, not read it the way some people can, but feel it very um, effortlessly, good or bad. Uh, and so I wound up then having mentors who were incredible in mindset training. And it just fascinated me. Like, why are we learning some of these things in school when we're not learning about how our mind works? Like, our mind, like that's the foundation of everything. So I had some of the best mindset trainers in the world um, after that, mentors. One being Bob Proctor. Bob Proctor is the reason the book The Secret is the, is the secret, even though this woman, Rhonda, wrote it. Um, Bob was my mentor at 25 years of age. I heard him speak at an event in Toronto. And um, by the way, Amy, you don't know this. All of the craziest things in my life, all the biggest tipping points in my life have a root in Toronto. It's the weirdest thing. I must have had a past life in Toronto. It's the weirdest thing. Anyway, um, so... Uh, Bob Proctor spoke at an event in Toronto at what then was the Maple Leaf Stadium. Now it's something else. And um, every word he said resonated to me, everything. And, and I don't know if what I'll say tonight will do the same thing for you or other people that you've heard to when someone just everything that they're saying resonates, and you're just drawn and connected to that content and that, that energy. That's how I felt with Bob. And even crazier, I knew that I knew everything he was saying, but I had no idea how I knew it. No one taught it to me. I just knew it. So I went up to him after the event. There was like 35 to 50,000 people in the stadium. It was a packed stadium. I somehow fought my way to him and told him, I need to sit at your feet and learn everything from you. And I must have looked a little like bright-eyed and bushy-tailed enough for him to care. And he literally handed me his business card and said, if you're serious, you will call my assistant on Monday and she'll tell you what to do. So I called his assistant on Monday and she told me to be in California uh, a few days later for this conference, for this event. Now, I was a young business person at the time. I had a gym. I was still learning what I was doing. I was paying everybody before myself. And um, I had already been in Toronto. So I really had no financial rationale to logical to go to back on a plane and go to California now. Um, I had to go to California and stay at a Ritz Carlton for this event, which back then I was like, what, where, <laughs> and how much is that a night? And um, in this event itself, the training itself was $10,000. This is back in 19... Um, 99, 2000. So it was in 2000, 99, 2000. So that was a lot of money back then. It's a lot of money today still. So I did it because it was one of those things that I just felt I knew I had to do. And it was a test from the universe that are you going to do it? Or are you just going to keep sitting and watching life go in front of you? I thank God that I did this because I wound up in this mastermind with 39 other people. There was 40 of us total. It was a three-year training, 10,000 a year, by the way, not 10,000 for all three. And um, we met four times a year and then had some webinars in between. And um, Bob Proctor was my teacher. And um, he then also brought in people like Mark Victor Hansen, Wayne Dyer, Jack Hanfield. They all became our teachers too, uh, personal teachers. Remember, we're all, there's only 39 of us. And um, it was the most incredible experience of my life. And um, again, for those of you who don't know, the book, The Secret, is the secret because one of the girls in my training, this girl, Rhonda, took copious notes and turned it into a book. Who knew you could do that? Who knew that you could just take notes on what somebody's teaching you and turn it into a book? But she did. God bless her. Um, I was a little jealous in the nicest way possible when I realized what had transpired. Um, but she did make Bob the, the whole star of the show. Um, 
But it was an incredible experience that taught me mindset training, taught me the power of my mind, taught me the power of self-responsibility, taught me the power of perspective, taught me pretty much that I can write any story that I want and taught me that energy is everything. And from that moment of my life, from 25 years of age, I was intentionally creating my life. Everything that I have is counterintuitive. What my brother's life is like is what would be intuitive of my childhood. Um, what I created is not intuitive of my childhood. And, and also even to add to it, and, and Lori can attest to it, from where we're also from, uh, in, outside of Philadelphia and Delaware County, uh, is also not very logical or typical. So um, I believe that all that training and looking at what would be logical approves how worthy and valuable the information was. Um, from that moment on, um, I just kept learning. I still learn ferociously every day. Uh, I still have mentors uh, who keep getting me to the next level of mastery. And um, I've just committed my life to teaching people. Uh, so the exact career path, Marissa, to answer your question, um, was just a winding turn as it is kind of for everyone on this path. Um, I had the fitness background, so I was teaching people fitness all over the world for Reebok. Um, and I kept moving the needle on what the content was. I didn't want to really talk about nutrition anymore. I wanted to talk about emotional wellness. So I just kept moving the needle. Kind of like when I would go on TV younger in my career and they would want to talk about fashion because of the Butler Bag Company. And I'd be like, I hate fashion. I don't want to talk about fashion. And my publicist would say, just get on TV, talk about fashion, and then talk about what you want to talk about. Um, kind of like the sneaky chef for your kids. So you just make something that looks like what they want and then you sneak some things into it. So um, what I will tell you though, all of you, but Marissa asked this question, many of my students who have taken this training go on to teach it um, in one way, shape or form. Um, some independently stand on their own brand uh, and then some um, are in a corporate environment and will, if they're a manager or something at, in some way that they have influenced, start to just teach it within their teams. Some people actually switch from, I've had two clients that switch from sales uh, to leadership training in their corporation. So they um, basically go into the leadership training curriculum side and become leadership trainers for their companies. So there's a lot of ways you can do it. Um, if you're not, for some people aren't willing to take the whole entrepreneurial leap completely, um, you can actually intertwine it corporately as well. Um, and I can give you a lot of advice on that for everybody. If you say, here's how I am situated now, I want to push it a little bit further. I can always give advice of how to like move the needle a little. Um, so with that said, I'll, I'll tell you more and more about my stories throughout this course because uh, so much of my knowledge is because of my life experiences. Like I learned a lot in psychology, but it all didn't make sense until I was actually challenged with certain things in life. And that's where our real lessons actually come. As we said earlier, some things might stink, but when they happen, there's a huge growth opportunity. So there's a lot of terrible things that have happened in my life. And, and when they happen, I'm like, oh, now I'm like, okay, cool. What am I supposed to be learning? Because the faster I learn this, the faster I get over it. Uh, and, and so that's not putting my head in the sand, um, but it's, hey, Dawn. Um, but it's, um, it's finding the best in every situation. It's looking at the positive. And so when people will say to me, well, Jen, your life isn't rainbows and unicorns, I say, well, in my world, it mostly is because it doesn't do me any service to sit and watch the news and be scared and miserable because that's what I have anxiety if I watch the news. Um, I'm not being ignorant to what's going on in the world, but I'm also preserving my perspective. And so, yes, everything isn't perfect. And yes, there are challenges that come to life, but when we can control our perspective, we can get over those things so much faster. We can process the emotional state 
of it. Like Elise said, I'm okay with negative emotions because what she was also saying that she didn't say is because she knows that she knows how to process them. So she's not afraid of pain because it, it's not, nothing, nothing's an eternal state. She can go through that pain because she knows how to process it. Um, and so before we get started, to help give you all clarity, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. You don't, you're not gonna share the answers, but I want you to write them down to give you context. Because when we have context to things, I think we get more out of them. Um, and, and when we have our own agenda clear, we can get more out of it too. So the first question is, um, I asked you already why it's important for you to learn emotional intelligence. The next question is, what good can come from it? So some of you said it, like Amy said, I want to be a better mom. That's what's good that can come from it. But maybe it's, I'll be more patient with my family. Maybe it's, I'll make amends with certain family member. Or maybe it's, um, I'll finally leave my job because I know I'm worth more. All of, uh, these are all your personal things. You know, Marissa was very vulnerable to say she hopes that it helps her make better choices in relationships. So what are the, the good things that you believe can come of this knowledge? You can tie that into what aspects of your life do you think will improve? And um, this is a big one that takes truth and vulnerability from yourself. I'm, no one's grading this. What experience in your life would you like to rewrite a story on? Nothing has meaning until you give it meaning. What story do you want to let go of or rewrite? So I, could, I just was very vulnerable in telling you a lot about my childhood. My childhood is not a victim story for me at all. My story, my childhood story is my training ground for success. That's how I look at it. My ability to grow resilience, my ability to learn how to be self-sufficient, independent. Um, so I don't see it as a bad thing. I'm not a victim to it. It's, I probably asked it. If you read, I mentioned sacred contracts earlier, if you all read it, I probably asked for that kind of crazy childhood <laughs> before entering this world so that I could become who I am in this lifetime. And it was a very spiritual belief that you can believe or not believe, but for me, that's a belief that I hold just to keep peace in my craziness. <laughs> And again, going back to that rainbow and unicorn statement, there's no benefit in buying into everybody else's negativity. There's no benefit in staying in a state of fear. There is no benefit in complaining about what everyone else is complaining about. The only benefit is your emotional wellness. Because when we have emotional disease, dis -ease, it's dis-ease. Like, it literally becomes disease. So much of cancer, not all, but much of cancer estates are the state of long-term emotional dis-ease, suppression of emotion. And so I say to people when they want to be negative that I don't want to buy your cancer. I'm not buying your cancer. I don't want it. And when I say it like that to people, they're like, what? And I'm like, I literally am not buying into your cancer. You can eat that if you want, sleep on it. I'm not buying into it because I don't want emotional dis-ease. There's no benefit. Um, so the next question is, what person do you need to forgive the most? Could be yourself, by the way.
how would it help you in forgiving that person? Remember, forgiveness is freedom to yourself. What are your top two biggest goals this year? Everyone's been talking about goals lately, but I would ask this question even if it was July 16th. And what's been keeping you from achieving them already? Fear, doubt, Usually it's those two things for most people. But what's your fear based on? Is it really real? What habits would you like to improve upon? So I'm gonna tell you one of my habits that was so funny and silly, but it was massive. Um, just in the last 16 days, I love, it's like my only indulgence. I love coffee first thing in the morning, but that's not the indulgence. I only love Wawa coffee in the morning because, and, and if Wawa doesn't exist, I don't even drink coffee because of the French vanilla creamer. And then I went into my coffee. But I noticed that the Frenchman, I, I, I wake up and I feel energized. And then I drink the coffee and I feel tired. And I know, I've known that it was probably the creamer that was making me tired. Because there's sugar, a lot of sugar in that creamer. But that's like the only sugar thing that I do. Anyway. So the last 16 days, the habit, one of the habits that I wanted to change was not drinking French vanilla creamer. And I replaced it with tea, green tea, in the morning. And let me tell you how much more energy <laughs> I have than I already had. Like I already have, the, this is like a whole different level and I freaking love it. So by 16 days in, I have recognized a new value. The, the energy that I have without the French vanilla creamer is so much more valuable than the French vanilla, French vanilla creamer. But it was so hard giving up because I love that like warm coffee. I, that's what I was holding on to, the process, the warm coffee and the, and the creamer. Anyway, changing that habit in the first 16 days, I can tell is gonna have massive impact into my entire year. So it's just those little habits that might seem silly that can be life-changing. Um, what experience have you had in your life that once you have this knowledge, you wish you could go back and change? No, you can't, but you can learn from it. There's times where I'm like, man, I could have handled that so much better. I wish I knew what I knew today. Sometimes we can change it later, but you might not be able to change it, but you can actually learn from it. How do you feel when someone gives you advice? This is actually a very important question because it gauges somebody's ability to be welcoming to advice. And now I want to make a preface here. Advice by people that are well-intentioned, that are wise. <laughs> so how do you go with advice, advice by well-intentioned people who are wise? Um, and I ask this question because sometimes if you had a childhood that you were made wrong in often, your innate feeling could be to be defensive, even if you really do want to learn. 
And one of the biggest things I like to get people to, to, to acknowledge is um, how to tone down the, de the defensiveness and know that advice never has to do anything about your faults, but someone showing you how to do it better. It's a really big thing. I used to be really defensive when I was like, in, even in my thirties, I think it probably wasn't until I was 40 because I had always been defensive because my dad was always on me. My mom was too, to a degree, but my dad was always on me. So I'd be defensive. Like I needed to defend myself and it was innate. It was an instinct. I didn't even realize I was doing it, but it made it hard for me to really be open to receive so much goodness that I could have gotten all along the way. Um, and then do you feel that you operate from flow or force on a daily basis? Force means your will, like you're willing something. You're, and a lot of people have been trained like work ethic is will and force and push and motivation, very masculine energy. And there's a room for that masculine energy. But one of the things I believe, and since we're all ladies here, um, women have stepped in an opportunity to be more successful. Women are more than equally educated at universities now. Everyone has opportunity to this university called Google. And so it's not lack of education <laughs> that's holding women back from being more successful. And, and what I say that by that is not job caps, by the way. There's progress being made there. I'm talking about wealth creation. In 2006, women created less than 1% of the wealth in the United States of America. Wealth creation is female entrepreneurs, basically, creating their own revenue. So 99% of the rest of the wealth in the United States of America, which is a lot, was created by men which seems so crazy to me when I first heard this statement. And then I realized that, I know it's mind blowing, right Elise? So then my little psychology mind really wanted to dive into like, why, why? If they're equally educated and it's job creation, so it's not job cap, somebody else isn't controlling that, what are the limitations? So some of the smaller reasoning is women do create their own companies or entrepreneurial paths because they want flexibility. Get it. Most don't create more wealth because they don't believe they're worthy of having it for one reason or another. Many still hold the beliefs that if I'm too successful, I'm not a good mom. If I'm too successful, I'm not a good spouse. If I'm too successful, my friends aren't going to like me and they're going to be jealous and talk about me. So I'll just minimize myself so I don't have to go through that. And so in 2016, 10 years later, women only create less than 3% of the wealth. Crazy. And it's all belief systems. It's all worthiness belief systems. And until we change it within ourselves and then we change it in our children, it will continue and continue. A 2% increase over 10 years, while women in 2006 were equally educated at universities, are now almost doubly graduating from universities for men is not an answer. It's not good. So one of the things that I, um, well, real fast before I tell you this story, um, one of the things that I believe, and I recently had this clarity, is it's belief systems to eradicate those belief systems. Like you can be a good mom and be successful. You can be a good spouse. You can be a good friend. You can be a good daughter. But you, your, your boundaries might be different, of course. But I also believe that we're trying, we women are trying to operate under the success model that has been generations before us, which is a masculine success model. And that's okay, because there's a lot of lessons to pull from it. However, I do believe that women need to operate from a different success model. Because in my group, the mastermind group and I were talking about this last Wednesday night, if we all just put a number or goal, X amount of dollars 
I don't think many people in this group are going to be solely motivated by that number. But if I said, how many lives can you impact in doing that? Now you're like, oh, oh I'm going to help people? Okay, I can do that. And now it becomes more of a feminine energy. And so when women are goal setting, we need to goal set very differently. And not, while I believe the number is important, we all should have a number. We should all have a goal. But we should work backwards from that number of how many lives we're going to impact, how many uh, businesses we might help, how many, we have to go into that feminine reasoning that emotionally connects us to become more successful. And, and so that's just a limitation I think most haven't challenged. It might be my next TED Talk. I'm, I'm getting you all to hold me accountable right now. That after my one next week, that by my, my next TED Talk topic is uh, females needing a different set of rules for their own success, coming from a more feminine power place. Um, but when we are operating from the place of force, we're not in flow, and women are genuinely, feminine energy is flow. That's why it's actually powerful. Masculine energy is will and force. And so the more you learn about gender energies, the more you can um, really understand why maybe some of the things that you were trying to do to be successful weren't working out for you. And it's okay. Now you can change it. But one of the other things is um, just changing the paradigm for the younger generation. So for me, having 14-year-old twin daughters, um, back one of the things I did back when they were nine they first asked for their Instagram account, nine or 10, I don't remember now, but I think it was nine. And, um, and eventually, so eventually I said yes. By the way, they still don't have Snapchat though. Um, that's just too much to control. Um, anyway, I gave them guidelines. Instead of like this ignorance thing, I wanted to give them information and guidelines. So I gave them guidelines and I, said, you know, here's some safety things. And then you can only follow so many people because I want to be able to follow who they're following. So I needed to keep that number manageable. And, and then you need to follow people that I tell you to follow. So intentionally, I had them following all my friends who were rock star entrepreneurs doing awesome things. And so at the end of the summer, Madison said to me, mom, I don't know what book I'm writing. And I was like, what book, babe? Like, do you have a school thing that you have to do? And she's like, no, my book. And I'm like, I know what book. Like, what book are you writing? She's like, my book, the life book. And I was like, oh my God. So many of my friends launched books this summer. She actually thinks like it's a thing. Like every woman just launches a book. So by the end of that summer, my girls were literally thinking like, doesn't everyone write a book and start a business and go on TV? Like, don't that, that's what women do, don't they? And I was like, oh my God, their paradigm, their paradigm is that's just what's normal. There's no limitations that they're going to have to break through if that's their paradigm right now. It's just what women do. There's no like questioning, like if I do that, then I'm not going to be a good mom. It's like, no, that's what my mom's friends were doing all summer. So it hit me that the more we can get these kind of things in front of our younger generation of girls, the more it's just their paradigm. It's just what's normal, right? So um, I wanted to share that story because it's really fun and, and shows how we can shift something quickly um, when it's another generation. It's harder for us to unprogram something. Um, so with that said, I'm going to show you a quick video. Um, to show you about programming. And it's not to scare you, it's actually really funny, um, but it's to really demonstrate how intentional we all need to be when we are um, becoming a better version of ourselves. So hold on one second. I have like 50 screens open. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so maybe you've seen this before. For those, most of you haven't though. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. 
Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill, and I was really proud of it. Everything changed, though, when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses, and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle, and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Justin Salmon. First attempt riding the bicycle. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often. But I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy, I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. So this is what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I had to ride the bike and the next day I could I built some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird, though. It's like there's this trail in my brain. But if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike vlog. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a smarter everyday meetup, if you will, and I'm going to see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm going to try to ride a normal bike. 
<laughs> it's backwards. It's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I've proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this. I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. explain this around me and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. Yeah. Just a fake. Yeah. I'm faking. You don't believe You think I'm lying, don't you? Yeah. I'm not lying. I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things, because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin, I'm getting smarter every day. Have a good day. Okay, if you want to support Smarter Every Day, you can download a free audio book at audible.com slash smarter. I recommend Commander Hatfield's book, which is an astronaut's guide to life on Earth. I read it. It was awesome. If you think about it, I had to learn how to ride a different kind of bicycle, and my son did as well. But Commander Hatfield had to learn how to ride a different spaceship. Not only that, but a different type of space station. He was on Mir and the International Space Station. Jeff, how to operate the bike. All right, everyone. How crazy is that, right? Hello? I'm here. Oh, okay. Oh my God, I got so nervous. I was like, hello, everybody. <laughs> um, how crazy was that, right? Yes, it's crazy. Yeah. So what I love at the end, he says, no matter how you're looking at something, know that you have a bias. We all have a bias. And the key is to become aware of the fact that we have a bias. And then be open to how we can see perspectives differently than we might be seeing them. Um, so do you, are you all seeing the slide right now that says, what is emotional intelligence? Okay, cool, awesome. So um, keep in mind as you're learning all this, that all of our beliefs were programmed early on in our lives, usually by our parents first, some grandparents, teachers, neighbors, Anyone that had influence. The majority of our belief systems were, were embedded by the time we were seven. Now, we can change them. We can learn new things, but it takes intentionality. And thank you, Elise. I, I love that video because it demonstrates so much. What I want to hit home, a couple of things. Early on, he said, knowledge does not mean understanding. So our entire school system, without going down a path, our entire school system is about knowledge, regurgitating information, not teaching how to take knowledge and translate it into wisdom. He says understanding, I call it wisdom. So I want you to be open to, as you're learning all these different things here, how to turn it into wisdom. And usually that comes with relating it to your own life. So I'm going to share a ton of stories in the content because it helps people relate it to their own life. But you can insert yourself in any lesson and you'll learn more from it um, when you do that. Another thing is it took him eight months, five minutes a day for eight months to learn that new skill set, to rewire his brain, so to speak. So what does that mean for us? It means... The more you want to learn something, the more intentional and consistent you need to be about it. So if he did it 20 minutes a day, he might have learned it <clears throat> in six months. So <clears throat> I, even still, after 
learning this information for 20 years. Um, I do an, about an hour of personal development every single day because I need to keep evolving and growing for myself, for my own desires. But if we're only doing it when we feel bad, which a lot of people do, by the way, um, usually they get in a bad place and then they feel better and then they go right back to their old patterns of, of lifestyle. But if watching videos every day and doing classes and reading books made you feel good, you should keep doing those things that made you feel good instead of defaulting back. Um, because that's where growth happens, inconsistency. Um, and then, yes, Rhea, just to talk about what you talked about, what he was talking about, neuroplasticity, is so fascinating. I'll skim over neuroscience 101 in this course, but neuroscience, if I go back to school, which I'm not, but if I could, I would go back. If I could do it over again, I would have studied a dual major of psychology and neuroscience together. Because neuroscience is a newer science that teaches us how our brain works. And in that neuroscience, we're learning so much information about our subconscious minds that we didn't have access to before. We're learning a lot of, so most of the medical world believed that it, I'm 45, my brain was already done growing. I'm already done. We're now we're learning that you, your brain has neuroplasticity, now less and less as you get older, but you can create new neural pathways in your brain till the day you die. New neural pathways are new messaging systems that you can put new information into your brain. So this is why when, how many of you, know, you don't all need to, to say, but just think to yourself, have ever heard of doing affirmations? And when you're told to do affirmations, you're told to do them every day because you need to override it, whatever. So for me, one of my biggest fears was my fear of failure. It was embedded in me from when I was a child because my dad was in the military and failure is not an option was a mantra in my home. So I was scared to death to fail at anything. So I did, unfortunately, only what I was good at, which means I'm not even scratching the surface of my potential. My growth is minimal because I'm only doing things that I'm naturally good at. When I wanted to change that belief, when I identified that that belief was holding me back from my potential, and this was um, when my daughters were new, so in my early 30s, uh, I had to rewire my brain with an opposite mantra. So I created the mantra, I have more fear of regret than I have a failure. Because I recognize that fear is a real thing. It's innate in us to keep us alive in some way, shape, or form. So how do I use that fear to harness my potential? How do I use fear in my favor? Fear of regret. It's a lot worse than fear of failure. So I thought at the end of my life, I don't want to think what I should have could have. And I literally thought of myself as an old lady in a rocking chair telling stories to my kids about what I should have could have done. And that scared the heck out of me and propelled me into fast forward motion. So every day of my life, many, many times a day, pretty much all day, for a couple years, I would walk around saying, I have more fear of regret than I have a failure. I have more fear of regret than I have a failure. I have more fear of regret than I have a failure. And then I would follow up with, failure is just, a part, just part of the process on the journey to success. Failure is just part of the process on the journey to success. Because you can't become successful if you don't fail. So in saying that over and over again, it eventually became programmed in my brain to just be who, it is, who I am. I don't have to think about that now. I live like that now. But for a long time, I had to say it because what I learned is <clears throat> if for 30 some years, I heard failure's not an option, and I believe failure's not an option, I need to override the strength of that neural pathway by my new programming. So I can't just say it once and think I'm programmed. 
I have to do it over and over again to put as much strength and building in that than I did for the first 34 years of my life of the other belief that I had. So my point in sharing all this with you is that number one, give yourself grace as you learn all of this stuff. As I mentioned earlier, this is not a course of, of perfection, but it's a course of course correction. How do you course correct faster? And we all make mistakes and we will make mistakes, but give yourself grace when you do, but get back on the bike and figure out how to create a stronger neural pathway system to give you the life that you want. It takes consistency, it takes effort, and it's not learning this once and never doing anything with it, but learning it and practicing it and learning more and practicing it. The test is life, literally, that's the test. And those of you who have done this with me before or any of you have done personal development things and you learn a new perspective or a new way of handling things and you get out in the real world and you're like, oh, that was that thing. That was that thing that I learned. Now I get to practice it. That's the true practice. And every time I pass a test, I literally give myself like a virtual high five. Like, yes, I literally just passed that test. So, um, you can give yourselves a virtual high five too. It's okay. Um, I do it because it signifies to my brain, like, yes, the way that kid got to go meet an astronaut, I just get a high five, but I'm totally cool with that. Um, so I'm gonna dive in right now um, into more of the straight up emotional intelligence con content. All of that was emotional intelligence content, but um, kind of first I have to get this chat bar off of here. I don't know if you guys can see it, but I can. It's very distracting to my ADD. Okay, cool. So what is emotional intelligence? My definition and the definition of this course is it is the heightened sense of self-awareness. <clears throat> the heightened sense of awareness of why you feel what you feel, why you think what you think, and also why others may be acting the way that they're acting. And that gives you, sorry, I'm plugging in my computer. That gives you the compassion and the patience to deal with people at a greater level. So as I mentioned, learning emotional intelligence, you become more like Yoda to your own life and a Jedi to others because you become so much more aware and still and grounded. And then when other people are acting crazy and emotional, you can hold your stillness and you're calm in that space a lot more effectively. And you can usually start to rationalize, like, I must have triggered that person, or that person must be having a bad day, or that person must be going through something. And you can step into a place, even if it's not true, step into a place of creativity to just calm yourself down. I'll give you an example. There was a woman, um, I was speaking for an event just a couple of years ago, and when I was being booked, I said to this woman, listen, I can't fly out till the morning of the event because I have an event the night before. And she said, okay, and then I get my itinerary and she has me flying out the night before. So I call her and I said, listen, Amy, there must have been some sort of confusion, but it has me flying out the night before and I specifically said I can't, and she flipped on me. This is your problem. This was a miscommunication. You didn't communicate. Had, like literally like screaming at me. And I waited till she was done. And I said, Amy, apparently you're having a really bad day and it has nothing to do with me. So I'm going to hang up right now. And whenever it is that you process what it is that has nothing to do with me, we can resume on a phone call later. And so we hung up. And Amy called me back a few hours later that day, hysterical crying. And she said, Jen, I am so sorry. You're right. That had nothing to do with you. My husband has Alzheimer's disease. We have three little kids. And I feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders right now. And you know what? I probably booked incorrectly. I probably didn't hear you. But thank you for giving me the space to see where I was. Now, if I had gone back at her, like lunged back into her energy, Nothing good would have come of that. 
we literally would have become two egos going at each other. But for me to recognize this woman's flipping out can't have anything to do with me, gave her the space to recognize where she was. And sometimes we just need to give people the space. It is okay. It is one of the best strategies in the world to give people space. That man cave thing, is guys actually have that intuitively correct, where they disappear and then they resurface when they're ready. Where women's instinct, this is a generalization of a gender, but we more wanna talk it out right there and then. We wanna like go through it right, everyone has to get through it right away. And often no one's in the right place to do that right there and then. And actually people do need to walk away. And so it's okay to say to people, I need time to process. I need time to um, feel less defensive right now. I need time to uh, think about how I feel about this. And I'll get back to you. And that is totally okay. Now, somebody might not want you to do that because they might want to like go at it right there because they're in an emotional state. But it is always best to remove ourselves when we're in the same emotional state, meaning we're reacting, not responding. We will always respond better. How many of you have ever written an email, you didn't send it because you knew it was probably not the best thing to do. And you're like, I'll come back 24 hours later and you read it and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> that was way too much. I was so overreacting. So when we're doing that, we can actually recognize, pause, has power. And so that's emotional intelligence right there. When we can actually pause um, <clears throat> and, and reflect. So this is literally the process. Pause, reflect, reframe, respond. Pause, reflect, reframe, respond. And if you do that process consistently, your relationships will be so much better. And even if you need to reframe in just what suits you right, and what I mean is you don't need to be right. You just wanna be happy. So even if your reframe is, you know what? I'm gonna give that person grace. They're going through a bad time. They don't even know what a bad time they're going through, but they're going through a bad time. And just leave it at that and walk away. The Buddha saying, would you rather be right or happy? summarizes emotional intelligence. So by the way, I say that to myself whenever I'm triggered to want to be right. I will say, would you rather be right or happy? Would you rather be right or happy? And sometimes in the moment, my ego is like, be right, please be right. But I say it to myself enough to get myself down to just being happy. So emotional intelligence for many years, people thought was a soft skill set. So I would get so crazy when I go to companies and they'd be like, oh, that's a soft skill set. And I'm like, no, it's actually an impact skill set. It impacts everything. So <clears throat> we can have the smartest people in the world with the best technical skill sets, but if they don't have human skill sets, they're not gonna be successful. So <clears throat> emotional intelligence really is, I believe, the essential ingredient and the foundation to all success. So why is it important? Because it affects literally every single aspect of our lives. If you are not emotionally intelligent, you will self-sabotage all day, every day. Because remember, emotional intelligence is the heightened sense of self-awareness of why we do what we do, why we think what we think, and why we feel what we feel. So a lot of people are in the same finance cycle over and over again, year after year, Decade after decade, why? Because they never became more emotionally intelligent to understand their beliefs and energy around money. And so they might have become more successful, but then they self-sabotage. We've all met those people, right? Or they might have lost weight and then they gain it back. Or they might have gotten in a couple of good relationships, but they self-sabotage them. And, and so when we become more emotionally intelligent, we understand we contribute to everything. And we understand our contribution, or we at least try to understand our contribution. And we figure out how to not be a common denominator in things that we don't like. So 
every aspect of our lives, by the way, is intertwined and interconnected, everything. So if you only focus on your health, your finances are probably gonna suffer. If you're at the gym every day, you're not going to work, and then you're also maybe focused on your relationship, you might not be showing up for what you need to to have your success quadrant in order. If you only focus on your finances and not your family or your health, you're gonna have some other big issues where you wake up, your partner's leaving you, your kids don't know you, and then you're having a heart attack because you've been so stressed out. So most people focus on one or two of these quadrants. In order to be truly successful, we have to focus on all of the quadrants every day. And if you wanna focus on one more than the other, let it be personal growth. Because if you're focused on your personal growth, then the other quadrants are undeniably gonna grow. I believe that you can't teach someone to be more successful without teaching the fundamental skills of emotional intelligence first. Because, again, people that are emotionally intelligent can see the common denominator. They can quickly see their contribution. They can quickly say, huh, I keep getting the same result, which I don't like. What am I doing to create this? There is not one experience in my life right now that I will not say, what am I doing to contribute to this? It might be putting up with energy that I shouldn't put up with. It might be staying friends with somebody longer than you should have. Michelle in the very beginning talked about how emotional intelligence made her realize that she was staying in this friendship so much longer than she should have and how awesome it felt once she recognized that and freed herself of it. So when, when we learn emotional intelligence first, all other aspects of our lives become more successful. And the most successful people, and when I say success, I mean people that live in a state of happiness, people that live in a state of fulfillment. You don't need to have the top title. You don't need to have the most money in your bank account, but you need to wake up every day feeling like, I love my life. I really love my life. And yeah, there are moments that are gonna come up, of course but you can get through them so much faster. You can overcome them, you can process them differently. <clears throat> and even in the hard days, you know that better ones are coming because everything is temporary. And so I love to get all of my clients to a place where they wake up and say, I love my life, it's a good life, happy, joyful. Joyful. Um, when I was speaking at a, a seminar, uh, a, a lecture uh, in England at a university um, a few years back, a student said to me at the end, raised her hand and asked a question. He said, you have all these accomplishments besides your daughters, what's your greatest accomplishment? And it hit me with clarity like I didn't have before. And it's like, I knew it, but I didn't know it. And it just came out of my mouth. And I was like, inner peace. That's the greatest achievement I've had. Because if y'all knew that story that I shared with you in the beginning about my childhood, you would understand why inner peace is the greatest achievement. And quite honestly, I believe it is for most people. When clients come to me and they're looking to be more successful, I'll always ask them why. Why do you wanna be more successful? And they'll usually say, well, I want to provide for my family. <clears throat> but why? Well, I want my kids to have a good education. But why? And I'll keep asking, but why? And all the answers are really granular and superficial. To the truth, always comes down to the same thing. Because they want to be loved and happy. The common denominator of every human being. So then I say to them, why don't you just ask me to teach you how to be happy? Wouldn't that make more sense? But they think in the having of all these things that they'll be happier. But if you actually learn to be happy first, you'll get to the other things a lot faster. Because if we're happy, people are more drawn to us. If we're happy, people want to do business with us. If we're happy, people feel this energy from us that they just want to be around. When we're happy, 
we have a better perspective. So we're seeing more opportunities. We're more grateful. We appreciate what we have while we have it, although we want maybe more, which creates a better frequency. I told you in the beginning, I'm going to say the word frequency a lot because it's really important. Your frequency is everything. We are all, this is quantum physics, not woo woo stuff, quantum physics 101. We are all energy in motion. A bunch of molecular energy moving around. Everything is. Everything is energy. So the greatest success stories come from the people who figured out how to master their energy. You can force yourself to a degree of success. Everyone can. But the most sustainable success happens when people's belief systems align to what they want to achieve and when their energy is in a place now remember success there's a lot of people that have a lot of money that are miserable so remember when i'm saying success i'm not just talking about dollars in the bank account or titles i'm also talking about happy fulfilled people they have great frequency we all know them the people that walk in the room and own the room and you just they're not maybe not the best dressed even or the best looking and you just were like, what is, what is it that they have? I want whatever it is that they have. That is somebody with awesome frequency. That is somebody who understands how to manage their energy to affect other people. And that is the number one thing that I want you all to learn to maintain and make a priority. And when I say high energy too, by the way, I don't mean like off the wall, like energy, like I had five Red Bulls. I mean, like, just feeling good, just feeling happy, feeling calm. Calm is good energy, by the way. I used to not know that at all. I thought good energy meant, like, off-the-wall energy. My nickname, by the way, when I was a kid was Cyclone. So it was natural in me, but that was my nickname because I had so much energy. But good energy can also mean calm, grounded energy. And that calm, grounded energy can get so much accomplished because you're in a state of calm. How many of you ever worked with people in a state of fr frenzy? Like, we gotta get it done. Oh my God, we gotta get it done. It is crazy. I can't, I can't even be around that energy. But in that energy, I call it busy energy. Busy energy is not productive energy at all. You wanna have productive energy and energy that affects other people. Remember that. How is my energy affecting others right now? By the way, we've all been in rooms. I want you to think about this. Think about how it feels when you're in a room with someone where you're like, I just can't, mm. their energy is just, you just, even if they say all the right things, you're just feeling, ugh, right? Animals and babies are really good with this, or toddlers are really good with being good sensors of this. Now think about when you're in a room with someone with amazing energy, how does that feel? So you wanna be that person. So how do you get to that state every day? I'm gonna give you some quick solutions. Go into a place of gratitude and appreciation, first and foremost. Take any complaint, and turn it into a gratitude statement. Take anything that you're looking to see wrong and figure out how you can make it right. When someone's irritating you, instead of focusing on what's irritating you, challenge yourself to instantly shift to what good can I find about this person? We all can find something good. Even if it's, I like their tie or I like their shoes. Even if it's just something minute and maybe even superficial at the moment, Focus on that, because that changes your energy. And the more you work on yourself, the more capable you will be of controlling this very quickly, I promise you. Now, I wanna just look real fast at the, um, I see the chat is going crazy, so I wanna just make sure no one has questions. Um, would you rather be a writer happy? Four quadrants. The four quadrants are um, health, success, so finances, because if your finances are off, you're off. 
um, relationships and personal growth, your own personal evolution. Those are the four quadrants. Um, okay, all right, good. I just wanna make sure I wasn't missing any questions. Once I put this on full screen, I can't see the chat unless I close it down. Okay, cool. Um, so does anyone, are there any questions before I go on further? Because we're going to dive deeper again. All right. Oh, there's a question. Hold on. Oh. Thank you, Elise. I appreciate that. All right, so until you jump over your own inner roadblocks, the outer ones will stand firmly in place. <clears throat> I know no one here, but how many of you know someone in your life that <clears throat> everything is everyone else's fault? Every job problem that they have is someone else's fault. Every relationship problem, every family problem is someone else's fault. And remember I used the word common denominator earlier? They don't even see that they're the common denominator and, oh wait, why have you been through three jobs in three years? Oh, it seems like the same story over and over again. Maybe you're participating in that story but they cannot see it. They literally cannot see it because they've been so conditioned to project blame on other people. So they don't want to take responsibility. They're completely unaware. The, the, the person that I talked about earlier with the blindfold and the pinata, they're that person. And unfortunately for a lot of those people, until they decide they want to be aware without a blindfold, they will stay there. So um, you just have to be in control of your own stuff. You want to be more successful, get over your inner roadblocks. So when outer ones come up in life, which they will, you can just get over them pretty quickly. Like, oh, look, that's a problem. Here's a solution. Oh, look, that's a problem. Let me find other people that can solve it with me. But how many of you also know when problems arise, the people that just focus on the problem? And then talk about the problem more and then complain about the problem more. That is the majority, unfortunately, of our society. And so when you're becoming more emotionally intelligent, you don't have time for people to like, okay, we have already identified the problem. Let's figure out the solution. Let's create a team around us that can figure out the solution and move forward. So those obstacles just seem like eh, a little hurdle you have to get over. Once you master yourself, you'll master your life. And I say this because it all begins with ourselves, self-responsibility, learning that we are contributing to things happening around us, learning that we're responsible for our own perception and our own emotions, and we're responsible for how we navigate the world. And no one else is responsible for our feelings. And this is such a hard one for people to really grasp. People will battle me on this for months or years or maybe even forever. No one is responsible for how you feel. And guess what? On the good note, you're not responsible really for how anyone else feels. Now, yes, there is social etiquette. We all have it. There is professional etiquette. We want to handle ourselves in the highest version of ourselves. But in the highest version of ourselves, we have the best intentions. And so we've all done something in our life with the best intention, but somebody on the other side interprets it, interprets it differently. Now, we're not in, responsible for that other person's interpretation. As a matter of fact, their interpretation is based on their life experiences up until that moment. We can communicate with that person effectively to try and show them our intention. We can try and <clears throat> help them see our perspective. <clears throat> we can assure them and affirm them, but we are still not responsible for how they're viewing the world. They are. So if everyone took self-responsibility, let me just tell you how much easier all, every relationship of our lives would be. It would be amazing. But remember, if you 
recognize that you're not responsible for how other people feel. You have to take responsibility for how you feel when someone else is making you feel some way. I'll dive into this a little bit deeper, but right now I'm gonna add to that. If somebody, let's just say it's a loved one because there are deepest triggers. If somebody does something to us and it hurts our feelings, it's probably hurting our feelings based on something unresolved from our past. A past experience and emotion that we're bringing into this current moment or else it wouldn't bother us, quite honestly. So anything that you're upset about in this moment, there's something in your past that's unresolved that you're bringing into the present moment. But you interpret it in a way that you're upset with the other person. Like you didn't, this is a silly one, but let's just keep it as a silly one. You didn't text me goodnight. That must mean you don't love me. So in your mind, this, this is for sure. Like they don't, they, they, you don't love me. I'm not as important to you because you didn't text me goodnight. And if you didn't text me goodnight, that's what that means to me. And the other person's like, um, I fell asleep on the couch. I, that was not my intention. I fell asleep on the couch and I didn't want to wake myself up. So I just kind of walked and rolled into bed. And so now that uh, we've made that other person wrong and their intention was not that at all we are responsible for the interpretation we gave it. Now, in a really good communication and good relationship, the person would say, hey, babe, I noticed that you didn't text me before bed, good night, uh, before bed to say good night. And I, I love when you do text me good night. So I was a little disappointed when you didn't. So what happened? Now it's giving them an opportunity without blame. One step further, it could say, you can say, it made me feel sad. You're owning your own emotions, though. I felt this way. But show me why on your end. Instead of, you did this to me. I can't believe you. You fell asleep again. You didn't text me goodnight. And then all of a sudden, it's a big fight. We could use it in a million different examples, but I'm using that example so you can understand what I mean by own your own emotions. And then if you have an issue with how you're feeling, you can talk it through with somebody, but you still have to own your own emotions first. Emotionally intelligent people, really good leaders, maximize their potential every day. So they become the best versions of themselves every day to magnify the potential in other people. So for those of you Philly fans here, I know not everyone is, but um, I feel like the Eagles have been not just local news, but national news about what an incredible leader Coach Peterson is. And then what happened after the game the other day with Nick Foles and when the guy, Alshon Jeffrey, dropped the football, and instead of getting mad at him, he went over and said, I love you. And it's okay. And they all rallied around him, which that is not a typical football style, masculine, shame somebody phenomenon. And so the best leaders really magnify the potential in others, which means that kind of like what Nick Foles and Peterson said the other day, if we win together, we lose together. And, and so a good leader sees that at, we all have flaws. And we'll try to magnify the good in others. And when the flaws surface, still show the love and support to lift them up. So another interesting about Doug Peterson is there's a bunch of players on the team that have had some legal issues this year and that he could have let them go over. And instead, and he said this very publicly, which I thought was amazing, I just am going to love on them more. Their loss. And what Doug Peterson was recognizing is many of them didn't grow up in good childhoods. They probably didn't have father figures and they probably didn't have any true leaders around them that yet resonated. And they probably always felt shamed, alienated, abandoned. And so instead of abandoning them, he loved on them. He tried to be a role model to them. He tried to magnify their potential. Those five players, became the top five players of the season 
top five, top five, I should say, five of the top players this season. Nick Foles is not one of those people. Um, and it's such an awesome story of emotional intelligence because every good leader recognizes that everyone has stuff. We all have stuff. And when we care about the team or we care about our, anyone around us, we'll take the time to dig for this stuff. Like I said to that lady, Amy, I know this has nothing to do with me, but I gave her space for her stuff to emerge. And so emotional intelligence lends to taking the pause, reflecting, not just on ourselves, but to the other person. I wonder what this person's going through. I wonder how this person's feeling right now. I wonder if this person's in a bad mood. Maybe they're hungry. I mean, I can get hangry when I'm hungry. And so we can give people the benefit of the doubt without getting triggered as easily when we're emotionally intelligent. And our intention is to magnify the potential in others. So the purpose of emotional intelligence is it affects literally every aspect of our life. As we mentioned, those four quadrants. Every single choice you make, every reaction you have, and every problem can be solved more effectively by increasing one's emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is a heightened sense of self-awareness, along with the awareness of others, so that you can have a better understanding of the choices that you're making. And I learned to identify what self-limiting beliefs you have and what behaviors you have that are holding you back from achieving your goals. The greater one's emotional intelligence, the easier and more successful life gets. Literally, the easier life gets. Life is actually a lot easier than people think it is. We, with our ego tripping, make it harder. We ego trip and make life harder than it has to be by getting offended by somebody, by being hurt by something that somebody said that really had no meaning, but we gave it meaning. All of these things getting caught up in gossip, getting caught up in, in complaining, getting caught up in talking negatively. We make life harder by doing all of those things. And when we eliminate those things, our lives get so much more fulfilling, easier, and just more carefree instead of always a hassle and a struggle. So emotional intelligence decreases obesity because most Obesity is emotional. Most obesity is emotional. It's crazy, but it's true. And if more people actually learn emotional intelligence, they would be able to lose weight a lot more effortlessly. Um, I, I told you guys about my brother earlier and um, how he went on a very different path in life. And just recently, in the last two years, his girlfriend has been able to help him heal. He lost over 100 pounds almost effortlessly. When I say effortlessly, he just stopped overeating. He was eating his emotions. And he started being more active because he felt like he had more energy. So he'd walk more. He'd go play with their son more. He'd do more things. And his energy was just um, happier. And most emotional, most weight issues or food addictions come from an emotional connection to food. So many of you know, I had a sugar addiction, like a crippling, crippling sugar addiction. Because of my childhood, that was my coping drug of choice. I would seek sugar because of the drug high and numbing that it would give me. Now, I didn't know that as a child. As a child, it just tasted good and it felt good but I literally became an addict. And so my sugar addiction literally ran my life until I broke my addiction when my children were um, two and a half years of age because I changed my value and emotional connection with the sugar. I'll give you a little backstory to that. Um, when I just need to put my charger in again. Um, when my children were born, I had felt exhausted at a level of exhaustion that I had never, ever felt in my life. And at that point, I was still very much a sugar addict. 
And when they started to go to preschool and I was getting back into more of a routine with work and everything, I went to work one day and I was feeling amazing. And it was very clear in my mind that I was feeling really good that day, energized and mentally clear, productive. And when I went to the office, I was checking everything off my checklist. <clears throat> and then I went to their school I went to a Halloween party and I wound up being tempted with my favorite treat, which was buttercream icing. And I wound up eating a cupcake with buttercream icing. I went back to the office. And when I got back to the office, I felt exhausted. I felt mentally unclear. I felt irritable. I felt like I did not want to talk to anyone and I wanted to crawl under my desk and take a nap. And it hit me in that moment that the sugar stole my energy and I became very angry at the sugar. So my emotional connection leading up to that moment was always a good emotional connection. But now it shifted to an anger relationship. So I was angry at the sugar because it made me feel tired and it made me feel the way I was feeling. And I took a very clear snapshot of how I was feeling in that moment. And I realized that the taste of sugar no longer was a good thing to me compared to how good my energy felt. So number one, I identified a new emotional connection, which I shifted from friend to foe. And then I also replaced the value. So the value before was just this numbing high, this sensation, where now my value was feeling good, having good energy, feeling productive, being mentally clear. And so I valued my energy more than I did my energy and mental clarity, more than I did the taste of sugar. And I literally broke my addiction in that time frame, where I would look at sugar or any kind of desserts after that and think to myself, exhaustion. And I wasn't tempted to eat it especially the way that I was earlier on. And any time I was tempted as I was reprogramming my brain, I would say to myself, nothing tastes as good as good energy feels. So that was my mantra to help rewire my brain. So when people learn emotional, emotional intelligence, <clears throat> they can start to identify emotional connections that they have with food, where it came from and how to change it. And, that's a powerful thing. So another example I always give is, you know, I had a crazy childhood. So on Friday, sometimes I would go to my grandmom's house and at my grandmom's house, I felt so safe, so loved. And my grandfather was this cute, sweet little quiet man. And my grandmom and I and my grandfather would sit in front of the TV and eat dinner, which totally was not allowed back then. And um, we'd have these little TV trays and we'd have pizza which was a treat for dinner. And then we'd have ice cream in those little Dixie cups. So what then from an emotional intelligence standpoint would be the first thing that I would reach for when I would feel stressed out? Often pizza and ice cream. But it wasn't the pizza and ice cream that I wanted, although that's what I thought I wanted. What I was actually searching for, reaching for, was the emotional connection, the emotional state that I had in that moment. So once I could realize, okay, it's not actually pizza and ice cream that I want. I just want to feel safe right now. I just want to feel happy right now. Then I could learn how to replace those behaviors. Okay, when you're craving pizza and ice cream, think to yourself, what are you really feeling? What are you really desiring? And then if I can recognize, like I just said, I wanted to feel safe, who are other people or what are other things that you can do to feel that same sensation without eating the pizza and ice cream? And that is how we change, well, that's how we raise the awareness of the emotional connection. And we can logically replace the emotional connection to something new, to change the behaviors and the patterns. Um, Emotional intelligence decreases stress and anxiety. We learn how to process our emotions. We learn how to go through a litany of questions of, of why we're feeling the way we're feeling. We learn to live in the drama-free zone. 
when you're emotionally intelligent, you don't want to be around drama or people that create drama. You have uh, less mental clutter because you're eating better and you're hanging out with better people and you're not feeling as overwhelmed or stressed because you realize that worrying is a waste of energy. It decreases depression. Most depression, not all, most depression. Sorry, I'm gonna eat a cough drop because I've been talking so much for so long. Um, most depression is actually, majority of, of depression is from people repeating the same negative thoughts over and over and over and over again and believing their thoughts. Worrying about the same thing over and over and over again. And that's really what it is. They just don't understand that they have control of their thoughts. A lot of times when I work with teenagers, I love it because when you suggest this to them, they're, you saw the neural pathways are so much easier to change quickly. When you suggest this to them, they're like, wait, what? I'm in control of my thoughts? I can change my thoughts? I have that power? And it's so cool to watch them, like it clicks and they're like, oh, well in that case, I'm just gonna think better thoughts. And they can turn it around so quickly. So when we become emotionally intelligent, we are more in control of our thoughts and we understand the power of our thoughts. And when, when we're going down a negative path, we can course correct so much more quickly. Um, the second thing, the second big thing that we're in control of that contributes to depression is food or whatever it is that we're putting on our tongue, the chemical reaction. And many people never make the connection to what they're putting in their mouth, how it's affecting their brain, then how it's affecting their emotion. So I always share that cupcake story. And notice when I shared it, I wasn't just saying I was tired. I was moody, socially withdrawn. Like I felt in a depressive state because of what I put in my mouth. I wasn't, I'm not in depression. I was feeling amazing that morning. But because of what I ate, I felt in a worse state. That felt very depressive. And so those are two things people could change immediately to change how they're feeling. Decreases drama because you just don't engage in it anymore. Same with fighting and bullying. Uh, divorce and family separations still might occur, but they're handled more consciously. So that conscious uncoupling thing that people made fun of with Gwyneth Paltrow was actually one of the best things that she could have put out into main street media because she was basically saying it doesn't have to be this way the old way the, the fighting it can be something that's kind and nice and sweet um conscious co-parenting uh alcoholism drug abuse and all addictive behaviors with an exception um without getting too far in this most addiction states are an external manifestation of internal pain. So I'll give the example of my dad. I talked about him earlier and he was um, an alcoholic, an abusive alcoholic. He came from an abusive, emotionally unintelligent family. So he was already in a state of trauma as a child. And then when he started drinking, it felt good because it numbed the state that he was in in pain. And so he had his first sip of alcohol when he was 13 years of age. He lived in Chester, worked on a boat dock with all these older men that gave him beer. And so what he became addicted to wasn't actually the alcohol. It was the numbing, just like my sugar, the numbing that it put him in in order to feel better than when he was not in that state. And so that, that cycle continued. So people say that, um, people, people say that uh, alcoholism is genetic. And, and while it might be, I think it's more um, nature and nurture, environmental. So uh, if my dad is what he was, and I watch him open his first drink at four o'clock every day, and that's totally normal. And then he becomes belligerent and crazy and abusive. I'm number one, exposed to trauma. So now I probably want to be numb too. 
Secondly, I'm watching a behavior pattern that seems normal. Doesn't everybody open a drink at three, four o'clock in the afternoon? That's really normal, right? Drink straight through the, the night. And so the pattern would be normal that, or if my dad's at a local bar at four o'clock every day, and that's where everyone just hangs out, it's what you do, then it's normal that I go to the bar at four o'clock every day. And so not all, but many uh, addictive states can actually be healed by being healed, by becoming more emotionally intelligent and learning how to heal. The exception to the rule without going down a crazy path is uh, opioids because they usually sneak in from a totally different way and reason and it's a totally different animal in and of itself. So what can increase then is our health and wellness. We, when people become emotionally intelligent, they thrive at a way higher level. They're healthier. I do a lot of emotional intelligence training and curriculum for insurance companies because insurance companies have proven, know for a fact, all the data supports it, that when people are more emotionally intelligent, they are less sick, which means a better bottom line for an insurance company because they're not going, I don't ever have to go to a doctor for years and years and years because other than just like wellness checkups because I don't get sick. And if I like when you hear my raspy voice, it's literally from me just talking to it. But when um, you're emotionally intelligent, you make better life choices and you support your wellness. Um, productivity increases, so companies love that. People are more mentally clear and more engaged. Innovation increases because your mental clarity is up, which means creativity is up. Your finances improve because you believe uh, in an abundant mindset. You believe in your capabilities and your worth, and you stop self-sabotaging your financial cycle. Uh, your happiness increases. Your life fulfillment increases. Um, your safety to learn. People thrive. For those of you who have businesses or are in businesses, the most successful businesses are when everyone feels safe. Safety to learn and thrive. Um, People, when they're in a company and you feel safe to contribute ideas, when you feel safe to fail, is when the company becomes the most successful. And granted, no leader says, please fail. But people are saying, you know what? We're going to try some things. And they value someone taking calculated risks. And they value someone taking chances out of their comfort zone. Um, relationship satisfaction increases. Um, because we learn to be better communicators, more compassionate and, and empathetic. So as you can see, it's basically the foundation. And what happens when you build a house on a weak foundation? When storms come, they fall apart. And most people's homes, their own internal home, is built on a shaky foundation. Not by fault, usually just by chance. From childhood experiences, from high school, college experiences, um, the foundation is shaky. And so when things happen, people fall apart. And when we can have a solid foundation, storms come, they will always come. We can weather the storms differently. So the question really is how high do you wanna go? How much do you wanna evolve? How, how much do you wanna accelerate? And I use this analogy because it hit me that my evolution never stops. It hit me so hard that I could keep going and going and going, but I have to be consistent and I have to be committed. But this analogy hit me so clear in my mind because I always need visuals to really understand abstract things. And I realized that when you're in a hot air balloon, <clears throat> all these sandbags are up there in the beginning holding you down and you decide you're ready to go. Like, I want to go see a new site. I want to go see things from a different perspective. That's conscious awareness. So when you decide to go and lift off, you have to take out some sandbags. Sandbags are synonymous for your stuff. You have to let go of stuff in order to get to another level. You have to let go of stuff in order to elevate. So what stuff do you want to get rid of? So let's just say you let go of some stuff and you're in Central Park and 
you're hovering around and you realize, wow, this is so cool. I never realized there are so many trees in New York City. This is an amazing new perspective. Look at all the people, look at all the statues, look at all the architecture. All of a sudden you're seeing things from a different view. This is growth. But then eventually you start to get comfortable. You're just kind of hovering and you're like, okay, now I'm getting bored. Now I want to go to the next level. What do you need to do? Have to get rid of more sandbags, which means you have to get rid of more stuff. So every stage of our evolution is really about getting rid of more stuff, more belief systems that are holding us back, more behaviors that don't serve us, more self-sabotaging or self-limiting beliefs. So we have to get rid of those stories in order to get to the next level. Before we go any further, I just want to check the chat because I haven't been paying attention to it. I see the numbers getting bigger. Um, Make sure no one has any questions. Everyone like the would you rather be right or happy? I love it. Um, anyone have any questions before I go any further? Because I'm gonna go really fast now and dive even deeper. Uh, love that you guys are loving this. Wait, are you guys not seeing the slide right now? Okay. We, right now it should say purpose. Do you guys see purpose? Okay, good. Now you see benefits? Okay, good. All right, cool. But not the full slide. Yep, yep, okay. I'll pull it back to full slide in a second. For some reason, when you put it into full screen, then I can't see the chat anymore. All right. Oh, what's that? All right, you guys see awareness up, right? So when you're emotionally intelligent, you, it's the awareness of who you are authentically. Like, who are you really? A lot of people don't know this, by the way. A lot of people, when I challenge people on this, will say they don't know because they become something that everybody else wanted them to be for so long. They have all these masks on of who they're supposed to be. And you know what's amazing? When you are your most authentic self, you are most powerful. And what's interesting is that we work so hard when we're younger to try and fit in and be like everybody else, to try and not stand out, and then try to please our parents and try to please our teachers and try to please our, our um, friends and fit into our social network that eventually we become 40, 50, and we think, God, I don't even know who I am. I don't really know who I am. So one of the coolest things I've learned to figure out who you really are is think about who you were when you were a kid. Like, think about your essence as a kid. So my essence as a kid is I would literally, my nickname I told you was Cyclone, so you can imagine <laughs> my energy. I loved playing outside. I hated to be inside. I would climb every tree. I would climb every mountain and hill. I would build forts. I'd swing off of like every swing as high as I could swing and jump. Broke my arm a couple times doing it. Would be on every monkey bars that I possibly could catch. Would go on that thing that you spin around on and run and jump on as fast as I could. And that summarizes my personality. I just was free and light and wanted to just explore and just have exhilaration. And I'd say I'm back there now, but there was definitely time periods of my life that I diminished that in time because I thought, oh, if I do that, I won't look professional enough. Or if I do that, people will think I'm, you know, when I was younger in business, people will think I'm too young and they won't take me seriously. Or Everyone else in my profession, all the other speakers, they act all professional and serious. And, and I realized being somebody else does not make me powerful. As a matter of fact, it just makes me 
just like everybody else, which we, we see that as a good thing. Usually when we're younger, high school is like a big time for that. But your uniqueness is your power. Like literally the greatest power that you have. So harness your uniqueness. And so if you can't figure out what that is, <clears throat> go back to that childhood time period of who you were. I had one of the most rewarding experiences of working with a client who was stuck. She had a great degree. She had a positive psychology degree, ironically, from Penn. Um, she had a, a great business model and she just couldn't attract clients or speaking engagements the way she wanted to. And so she hired me to figure out how I did it so that she could duplicate it. And I said to her, listen, I can tell you my exact everything that I do. I could give you my Rolodex even, but you're not going to have the same success. And the reason you're not going to have the same success is because, and I preface, I'm saying this with love, and I'm saying this because I want you to break free of this, but you seem like a fraud of happiness because positive psychology, her brand was around happiness. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, we just don't seem happy. And so you're selling happiness. And why would somebody buy happiness when you don't seem happy? And so you could say all the right things. You can teach all the right formulas from a psychology book, but you're not exuding it. So what you need to do is be happy first. And so she broke down and she's like, I can't even, I don't even know how to do that. I, I, I think I'm happy. I mean, I've made so much progress in being happy. And I said, well, it's, of course, it's natural. Of course you studied positive psychology to learn to be happy for yourself. That's natural. We learn what we, and we try to teach what we need to do the most, right? <coughs> so I told her this exercise. And she literally broke down in tears and she said, Jen, when I was a little girl, I just would dance around everywhere and I'd wear all these crazy clothes and I was just this free spirit and I have so much fun and I'd wear crazy colored shoes. And then her stepmom would diminish her, would put her down and make her feel bad and say side marks. And, and so she diminished who she was. And since she was a little girl, she had diminished that spirit of herself. So I said, be that little girl again. Literally become that little girl again. Exude her energy every single day. Literally step into, let's just say her name's Sally, it's not Sally, but step in a little Sally every day from now on. Step into her in the morning. Within probably about a month, like maybe even less, I'm not even kidding, she embodied little Sally every day and her business took off booming like booming literally booming because she exuded her authentic self and I know most of your business owners on here so I'm putting some extra effort into this because I really want you to hear me loud and clear because the more you step into your authentic self and not try to duplicate you need to duplicate models you can't duplicate anyone else you have to be yourself and the more you step into your authentic self your energy just radiates her energy radiates now she's like this free spirit awesome energized soul exuding happiness because she finally said i'm gonna go back to who i am and not worry about what everybody else thinks of me and she let it go literally like almost overnight her business took off so please take heed as to what i'm saying challenge yourself am i my authentic self or am i trying to duplicate somebody else right now and if you are Stop and step into yourself. Um, and by the way, when I get in a funk and I get too serious, I think we all do that as adults. There's times where I'm like, man, I'm heavy. This feels so heavy. I'm not feeling fun right now. I think about little Jenny sliding on the slides and swinging from the swings, and I literally try and step back into that energy. Um, emotional intelligence is the awareness of why you're here, what your purpose is. The more you're emotionally intelligent, the more you're aware of your purpose. By the way, for those of you who aren't sure of what your purpose is, usually the, your biggest pain, your greatest pain, is a direct correlation to your purpose. It is a roadmap, I promise you, every person I suggest this to. 
finds that this is true. Your greatest purpose, I mean your greatest pain, usually is in direct correlation to your purpose. So why do you think you are maybe through that pain? To live your purpose. But what happens is often people become victim to the pain for so long and make that their story for so long that they never actually step into their purpose because they're stuck in the story of their pain. So once you actually let that pain be your teacher and your guide. And so I use this example. It's very simple and basic and we all can get it, but Mothers Against Drunk Drivers became what it was, changed many of the laws to make our roads safer because of a woman losing her child. And so her pain actually became her purpose. Now, this is like a very philosophical conversation, but in the big scheme of things, that woman living that pain of losing her child, which God knows none of us would like to, to feel, she probably saved so many other people's lives. Like, it's pretty powerful when you really break it down. So if you're not clear yet as to your purpose, think about your greatest pain. I told you guys my childhood story. Um, what I left out was my tipping point, my clarity moment that I didn't even know was my clarity moment. But when my, my, when I was going into ninth grade, my, I caught my dad cheating on my mom. And I was so excited, so excited for my mom because I was like, yes, she has a chance to be free and feel loved. Like she never felt loved in her marriage, which is so sad to me. And I went to dinner with my mom and I told her mom, dad's cheating on you. And she looked at me and she said, I know, I've known all along that it's easier to stay than it is to go. And I was like, there's no way it's easier to stay. Like, how? Like, this is hell, like literally hell on earth for you. And although women made money back then, they didn't make much money. And my mom was doing really cool things, but she only made like uh, $30,000. And every Friday, Literally every Friday, my dad took her paycheck as she walked in the door and controlled her by controlling her finances and her emotional and mental state too. And so my mom knew, okay, my daughter knows this now. I can't stay here because it's such a bad example for her. And unfortunately, my mom was right that staying actually was easier than leaving because my dad wrote the laws of the state of Pennsylvania for divorce and not one attorney would represent my mom. And the stress of this whole divorce process, she wound up having a massive stroke and lived in a wheelchair the rest of her life because of the stroke. And so <clears throat> during this process, I remember thinking, I will never allow anyone to control my finances or my happiness ever. And it became my purpose. It's why I do what I do. I didn't realize that. I was creating the sacred contract at a very, my, my daughter's age, creating a sacred contract at their age that I didn't realize I was going to live out. And it was not, every step wasn't intentional. It was just following my heart. And I do what I do for a living because I never, ever want anyone to feel that level of pain or feeling trapped the way that my mom did. And to end a life, she lived about 18 years in a wheelchair. But that life was literally also hell on earth because she was a prisoner in her own body, highly handicapped, and had to have everybody else take care of her. And I never, and this is why health, by the way, is so important to me because her stress, remember I said earlier, dis, dis ease is disease. Her stress was so hard on her for so long leading up to that moment that that's what caused the stroke. So um, this is my purpose. Now you guys actually know the, the bigger, the deeper answer, Marissa, is because I know that when people learn this information, they never have to live like my mom lived. And my mom, by the way, which is the, the even more ironic thing, was one of the sassiest, mouthiest women <clears throat> so strong in every aspect of her life. She ran campaigns for politicians. All the male politicians were scared of her. Um, like they're not like scared of her like she was mean, but scared like she just didn't take nonsense from people. 
She was so, she had a TV show. She put um, politicians in the hot seat. She was really like strong woman. So what, what always stood out to me as I became an adult is how was someone so strong on the outside in the external world? But in her home, she was being beat down every single day of her life. So I realized if it was happening to her, it was probably happening to a lot of people too, which is crazy. So my pain is my purpose that I'm sharing with all of you now. Um, it's also the awareness of what you've been through. So I just shared that story with you, and now you all probably feel a lot more connected to me. Because it's real. We all have pain. I'm sure those of you who heard Marissa's story earlier on tonight, felt you just met her and felt connected to her. When we share our flaws with people, we actually connect with them more than saying, here I am, I'm perfect. Here I am, this is how things are done. And when we say I'm flawed, when we can say I'm, um, I've been through things, we actually connect with people a lot more deeply. Um, so share your story when appropriate and how appropriate, but when people understand their, that you're, you're, you have stuff, people actually connect. I get it. I've been through that. I know some people on here are in real estate. If, when you're dealing with real estate, you're dealing with a lot of personal issues with people, reasons that people are moving. To, to be able to connect with somebody as they're going through something, then they feel less judged. They emotionally connect differently. Um, and then we become aware of why we feel what we feel. It's our perception. The only thing you have control of in this world, the only thing is your perception. The only thing. But the good news is you can change your perception when you see new information, when you gain new wisdom. So the greatest leaders actually have the ability to change, not just change their perception, but see multiple perceptions at one time. So the greatest leaders can say, okay, here's my perception, but I can understand other people's perception at the table here. I can anticipate other people's perception. And that makes the most effective leader because we might not agree with other people's perceptions. And we might not agree at all, but we can at least understand it and anticipate it. When you can do that, you can actually navigate issues before their issues. You can actually be empathetic to somebody else's position. So don't have to agree upon it, but at least be empathetic. And, and one more thing to that, we see on Facebook and all social media, people bashing and all the like political wars and stuff. People are just trying to be right. Instead of saying, show me, I, I mean, your view is so different than my view. Show me why you feel that way. And when I take time to do that, I am blown away at how powerful somebody else's perception could change my perception. I still might believe in my perception, but I also understand their perception. And I don't have to choose one or, that's right or wrong. And that's the key. There isn't one perception that's right or wrong. There's multiple perceptions to every single situation. You and I can be through the same exact thing, hear someone say the same exact thing, and interpret it completely different based on our life experiences. So powerful. And again, you become the most masterful leader when you can not only uh, understand other people's perceptions, but anticipate people's perceptions before they become a problem. It's also the awareness of what motivates us and why, our desires and passions. So the height of emotional intelligence begins with beginning to be more mindful. Mindful of the thoughts we're thinking, the words that we're choosing, the feelings that we're feeling, the foods <clears throat> that we're eating or drinks, and how they're making us feel. <clears throat> People that we're surrounding ourselves with and how they're making us feel what we're watching on television a lot of people think a lot of television that they're watching is entertainment and it is completely messing with your perception of the world and and completely messing with your energetic state by the way bringing down your frequency 
uh, the music that you listen to. I don't, I mean, I'm sure our parents said this, but have you guys listened to some of the lyrics of music today? Like things that my, my daughters will listen, their, their friends who listen to, mind blowing to me. Like I couldn't listen to Madonna like a virgin when I was a kid because my mom would freak out. So the lyrics create a thought process. They create a reality. So we have to be very aware of not just what we're listening to and how it's affecting us, but if we have kids, what they're listening to and how it's affecting them as well. I'm going to go back to thoughts for a second. We're thinking, uh, some people say 36,000, some people say you know 70,000. We're thinking a lot of thoughts a day, every day. What are your dominant thoughts? Positive or negative? Supportive or disengaging and disempowering? First step in becoming more emotionally intelligent, more mindful, is getting control of your mind and the thoughts that you're thinking. And so when you catch yourself doing a negative thought pattern, I use what I call the mental reset button. So when you do a mental reset button, you're literally thinking delete the negative thought pattern. You can visualize it like a computer. Delete the negative thought pattern and replace it with a positive thought pattern. Now, if you've never done this before, I suggest having three positive thought patterns that you write down. Write them down on a piece of paper. <clears throat> keep them with you. Keep them in your car. Keep them in your purse. Keep them wherever. Keep them with you. Because at first, you're going to go, oh my God, what should I be thinking about? And the more you think about what you should be thinking about, the more you're going to keep going on that negative thought pattern. So if you have it, you're like, oh, I'm going to think about how much I love da -da -da, whatever. Now you're on a new thought pattern. Keep it with you so that you don't, it's kind of like if you're on a diet, always have your meals ready and have like snacks with you. So you just don't go grab for a donut. Because if you have a handful of nuts, you're gonna eat that first. Same thing with retraining your thought process. Gaining control of your mindset is mastery. This is where you become Yoda to your own life and a Jedi to everybody else's. The words that you're choosing also create your outcome. So thoughts have a frequency, thoughts have a vibration, your words have even more. So if you're saying negative things to yourself about yourself, you are creating a very terrible reality for yourself. If you're saying, oh, I'm so stupid, I can't believe I did that. Horrible, self-abuse. If you're saying, I'll try to do that, you're not committed to doing it. So you're probably not gonna succeed, most likely not gonna succeed. When I work with people, for those of you who, who own companies in here or have teams, I listen to the words that people are saying more than what they're actually saying. Meaning, if someone says, I'll try to make it, Jen, I literally count them all out. From either, I take them off the guest list. They're probably not going to make it. They haven't committed to make it. If someone says, I will, or someone says, I am, or someone says, I don't know how to do that, but I'll figure it out. Those are the people I want on my team because those are the I can do people. And so what are the words are, that you're using are you projecting to the world right now? It's also becoming aware of your feelings. Parents, this is for everybody, but parents, this isn't just for you. Teach your kids to identify their emotions early on and they will have an easier time with identifying the emotions. So all of us usually have a range of emotions. Most people will say angry. I'm angry, I'm mad at that person. You're actually not. You're actually usually disappointed in the person. And so when you say I'm disappointed in somebody versus I'm angry at them, they're two different emotional states. And on an energetic state pendulum, Disappointed, so let's just put anger down here, the lowest frequency, as we talked about frequency earlier. Up here is love. Underneath love is appreciation. Underneath appreciation is gratitude. Those are the three highest energetic states. Those are the three states you wanna be in most of the time for a high frequency. Anger, down here, lowest frequency. Anger, hate. 
So if you're mad at somebody, your frequency's down here. If you're disappointed, it's at least up here a little. Disappointed means I'm owning some responsibility in this, that I had expectations for that person. However, I'm disappointed. And when you're having a conversation with somebody and you say, I'm disappointed in you, is a lot better of a conversation or communication than I'm angry at you. Which one are you going to be defensive in more? When someone says I'm disappointed in you to me, I feel horrible. <laughs> like I'm like, oh my God, make it better. Or like when I was younger, my mom yelled at me versus saying, Jen, I'm disappointed in you. I'd rather yell at me. Like I literally would have rather hit me with a wooden spoon than say I'm disappointed in you. So getting in touch with how you're really feeling makes you a more effective, emotionally intelligent communicator. And when you start off with a conversation with somebody, always own your feelings. I'm feeling disappointed. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling like, like, like I'm let down. However, I could be totally wrong. So please show me your perception of what happened here completely different than you did this, you made me feel this way, you let me down, you're a horrible friend. Somebody's only gonna be defensive. There's no productivity in that conversation. But when you start by owning your emotions, and then you ask somebody to, or, and you tell them your perception, and then ask their perception, you will become such a powerful communicator. Again, there are a lot more feelings than we, many people have vocabulary for. So start to really say, how am I really feeling? I'm feeling icky. Sometimes that's just the perfect word, icky. I'm feeling not inspired. That's okay, that's a perfectly good way to express how you're feeling. Try to create a range of emotions for your emotional state. Um, the foods that we eat, we talked about this a little bit. When you're eating sugar, sugar is the worst of offenders, by the way. And I know I'm ruining it for a lot of people, but sugar is the worst of offenders. If you want to be emotionally intelligent the majority of the time, you will remove the majority of sugar from your diet. There's actually a lot of companies now, which I love, that are actually having like criteria. Like you can't bring sugar, you can't bring candy into the office. I love it. I think it's great. Some people really hate it. I think it's great because if I was employing a team to do something and I want them to be at their top performance and I see a Hershey Kiss going in or a Hershey Kiss is going in the afternoon, I now know potentially that their brain isn't going to be functioning at an optimal level. But how, it doesn't have to be a no forever. It just needs to be... Uh, I probably shouldn't have this when I want to perform at my highest level. I probably shouldn't have this if I want to be patient with people and find the foods that do. So for me, avocado is the greatest brain food. It is something that's a staple in my diet every day because it gives, there's enough fat in it that gives your brain like nourishment to sustain for a long period of time without, to feel satiated for a long period of time. So I might have it with eggs. I might have it in a salad with protein, vegetables. Um, the, figure out the foods that your body operates at an optimal level with and choose those foods on a regular basis. And again, I'm not saying don't ever have candy again or don't ever have pasta. I love pasta, Italian after all. But I don't choose to eat it when I have to perform. I don't choose to eat it when I have to be patient with people. Um, I usually will choose to eat it when I kind of have nothing, which isn't often going on. So, um, but I do love it. I just, if I say to myself, I can't ever have it again, then I'm gonna want it all the time. So you never really say that. You just say, I choose to have it when I have more time to have it. Um, the people that we surround ourselves with, we can't remove some people in our life. I get it, I get it. Um, but you wanna remove the ones that cause you the most stress if you can. So I have a saying, detox the drainers and increase the enhancers. 
So if there's a lot of toxic people in your life and you want to move forward and be emotionally intelligent and have a drama free life, you need to get rid of some of those people first. And I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying they're in a different place and that's okay. And we women somehow have this sense of responsibility to maintain every relationship that we've had since like first grade. We don't have to. It's okay to grow out of people. It's okay to um, move on. And it's okay to say we're not in the same place. And, and some of those people might be your family. And what you do for family or coworkers, you can't remove yourself from completely. You just change your expectation. Change your expectation of them. So I told you guys about my dad. So if I assume my dad was going to be this emotionally available, loving, adoring dad every time I walked into his house, I would be highly disappointed. As a matter of fact, I used to do that. When I was younger, high school, college, 20s, I would be really disappointed that my dad wasn't a more loving, capable, adoring dad like all my friends had. My friends had amazing dads. And I would get angry, like, why isn't he like that? Or what? And I try and make him like that. I try to get him to see my point of view. I would get mad that I got the raw end of the dad stick. And the truth is that I got what I got, so I need to just make it the right experience. So the moment I realized that he is who he is, and I let that go, and I didn't expect any more than that, Every time I went to his house was a better experience because it just was what it was. And I didn't expect any more. And so expectations of other people are the number one thing that causes pain. Expecting other people to think like us, act like us, be like us, love like us, talk like us is the number one thing that will cause you pain over and over and over again. And the faster we learn that and accept that, the better our relationships can be. Even the difficult people get easier because we just expect them to be difficult. And we just minimize our time with them. Uh, sometimes people try to fit a circle in a square and it just doesn't work. Could be in our friendships, in our family. And I just talked to my nephew today and all this family drama was going on. I had no idea. And I said to him, I go, oh, I had no idea. And I go, because I can't do it. I won't do it. And he was like, I know, I don't either. But I'm always in the middle of it because he hasn't learned yet the skill to remove himself. And I said, listen, you just need to remove yourself. Like, just tell people you're not participating in the drama. That's their stuff, not your stuff. And so um, when, we, when we do want to remove people, by the way, when we want to distance ourselves from people, you don't need to make a production about it. You don't need to blame or shame anyone because <clears throat> that's not emotionally intelligent. You simply need to distance yourself. And yes, there's going to be people that will notice your distance and might get angry at your distance. And in those people, I will just simply say, I'm so sorry. I have so much going on. My attention and energy is all in this place and this place. And I'm going to be around a lot less, or I just don't have time to meet for coffee, or I just don't have time to go to this party or event. And I just decline the invitations and eventually it goes away. And so again, you don't want to blame or shame them. You just distance yourselves and create a new expectation or a new, um, a new normal for that relationship. So, I know it's 10 o'clock, and by the way, we are, we are just scratching the surface on emotional intelligence. It is a very layered, uh, very deep kind of thing where you can keep learning, and you're like, oh, God, that's a new perspective. Um, but one of the big perspectives I, I didn't say earlier um, that I really want to talk about before I go into this list that is so incredibly important is that nothing has meaning until you give it meaning. I actually said it, and I kind of brushed over it but nothing has meaning until you give it meaning. So why is that important for emotional intelligence? Because it's everything. Because literally, no one can offend you. There is no story of your past 
that you can hold on to when nothing has meaning until you give it meaning. So people might be like, well, Jen, that person stole from me. Jen, that person cheated on me. Give it a different meaning. I had a boyfriend a couple years ago after getting divorced who cheated on me. And instead of thinking something was wrong with me, instead of thinking, oh, I'm not enough, I literally was like, person has their own insecurity issues. They, they really did. But even if they didn't, that's the story I would tell myself so that I didn't hold the burden of that story. That's the cool thing about it. Nothing has meaning until you give it meaning. You get to write your story. You get to write your story. So every story from the past, you can change the meaning of right now. This is really cool. Also, a lot of responsibility when you realize that you can no longer be the victim of your story. It's very powerful. So here are the factors that impact our emotional intelligence. Your health. So if we're not feeling well, we're not feeling very emotionally intelligent. This is a checklist I want you to pay attention to, to be the best version of yourself. Your health has to come first. This is why I said to your insurance companies, invest in emotional intelligence training now, because they know that if everyone's emotionally intelligent, they're going to make better health choices because they want to be healthier. Exercise. So we all know how good we feel after we exercise. So I actually use exercise as a strategy in big days that I have for work. So if I have a huge presentation, a huge speaking engagement, I time my workout around that. So my adrenaline is still going if I can do that. Or <clears throat> I might not be able to do a full on workout. So I'll jump on the trampoline and just get my endorphins going, get my adrenaline up. <clears throat> so that I can feed off of the same kind of hormonal exchange that happens to make me more emotionally intelligent, more energized, higher frequency. Obviously, our people, the, I think people and our relationships highly impact our emotional intelligence because think about it, life is easy when we're kind of walking through like, dee, 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 no one's bothering us, everything's good, everyone's leaving us alone, everything's easy then. It's when we come to manage people and their stuff that life gets a lot harder for us. It's harder for us to stay not triggered. It's harder for us to stay in a good mood when we're around different people. But when you become emotionally intelligent, that's what I was saying again earlier, it's just people, all this craziness can be going on around you and you're just not phased by it. Their stuff, they're crazy. And you can just let them deal with it on your own. And you kind of stay grounded and centered in the middle of it. Foods, I've talked about a bunch, affect our emotional intelligence. Thoughts and words, as I just talked about. Alcohol and to toxic substances. I bring this up just quickly because um, it's something that I find really fascinating. A lot of people don't make the connection to. So when people are not, they had a bad day, a lot of people are like, I had a worse day, let's go get a drink. This is the worst time you can drink. Alcohol exacerbates the state that you're in. And so while it might make you feel numb and good for a little bit, it becomes a depressant. And, and, that, and sometimes it's not that night that you're, because you might just go home and go to bed. But a day or two later, it exact, can exacerbate a depressive state. If you're happy and everything's good, then you're going up. So that's okay. But it's interesting. You'll see emotionally intelligent people I hear this statement from emotionally intelligent people, and I can tell if they're emotionally intelligent, because they'll say, you say, hey, do you want to go out and have a glass of wine? They're like, no, I'm going through a crazy time right now. And they know not to do that then, which is counterintuitive to what society has trained us to do. Um, uh, our routine and discipline. So having a routine actually keeps us feeling in control a routine is so important and when somebody i can easily detect when someone doesn't have a routine because they're always just like hairy carry and just flying by the seat of their pants and then they're stressed all the time but they're stressed because they just didn't take a few minutes to create a plan to create a to-do list and have a, a schedule and a routine and i if you do nothing else in implementing an action plan tomorrow, start to implement a routine, a to-do list, plan ahead, have things organized. Um, it's actually interesting too, 
if you could see someone's desk or their bedroom, it's usually a correlation to what's going on in their brain. So my one daughter's room is very neat and organized. The other one is totally not. And literally how they operate in school as well. So when I was a kid, I felt a lot ADD. I felt very hard to focus. And one of the greatest things that I did to get control of my life, not just personally, but also in school, was create a routine and to-do list. And it literally transformed my sense of, minimized my sense of overwhelm and gave me an opportunity to feel more calm as things transpired in life. Um, discipline is really important too in following through. Uh, TV I talked about, reading, music, weather. Weather truly can affect how we're feeling. It's a real thing. So I need to move to Florida in three and a half years exactly. Um, that's when my girls graduate high school, for those who are wondering why three and a half years. Um, so <clears throat> with that, there's so much more to dive into in emotional intelligence. As you can see, we've been talking for three hours and 15 minutes straight, and we just are scratching the surface. Um, but I do hope that you have learned a lot. Um, and I want to check these messages. Okay. All right, so does anyone have questions? Any questions? Um, I do teach courses that bring this <clears throat> out um, into weeks, um, an hour a week for a couple weeks, so we go deeper and deeper. We're on slide, um, just so you guys know, we are on slide 17, and there's like 65 slides. So that's how much more there is to get into, but um, I hope you learn so much. If you are wanting to learn more, I mean, I'm gonna start another one in February, um, a weekly course where you dive deeper. Um, and then for those of you who have a one hour with me, I mean a 30 minute with me, um, I'm gonna send out a schedule, a calendar tomorrow for everybody to schedule that uh, so that you can do that as well. Uh, we do it via Zoom, we do a call. Uh, for some people that live in the area, I'm doing it in person, so it's, it's all up to region, really. Um, but are there any questions? There has to be questions. There's so much content coming at you. Questions, anyone? You can unmute yourself. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so so basically, um, it's so funny, like I'm in this training because I actually have a current friend who um, I, I care about her a lot. Like I see her as a sister and I, I regularly check in with her. And um, I think for like five months, she just like stopped like returning my calls and like um, stopped responding. But then like whenever she needs me, she'll give me a call like at 3 a.m. or just like if she needs me, I need to be there for her. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's. So, you know, over time, it's like, it wasn't like she was sick. She was just like always really busy with work and all of that. And it's like, she's posting on social media. She's like alive, she's partying, but she's like not returning any of my phone calls. And so it just made me like upset and just like, I felt dismissed. And for a while, I just like wanted to give her space because I knew I was like in that state of like, I didn't want to like be responsive and like get upset, but more just like calm down and get in tune with like what I really wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I gave her like time and then, you know, she called me and then this past week and I was just basically like, Hey, you know, she's like, is everything okay? And I was like, no, everything's not okay. Like I'm upset and I need some time to get my thoughts together. So like she texted me this morning, like wanting like an immediate response of like what's going on. And so I just, I gave it right. And I said, Hey, like, this is like why I'm upset. And so, you know, I think like the perception thing was like really good for me to like implement. Cause I like didn't implement that at that time. I think if I had more time to like draft out my response, I would, but I guess I don't, you know, like when you were saying like, if people want to like fade away, they will, or like they won't make that much, like, you know, you'll like stop calling or decline and all of that. I guess like, how do you deal with people who 
really want you there in their life 110%, but they don't show up in your life? Well, you have to assess how it makes you feel. And it, you have to assess um, what your expectations are, right? So you're expecting her to show up like you are, but she might not be capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. Because she's probably a different person from a different background. And, and so the highest form of respect, although this might sound hard, the highest form of respect is accepting someone where they are. Mm -hmm. We don't have to hang out with them every day. We don't have to engage with them, but accepting where they are. So she seems like she's in a different place of busyness in her life where you're maybe in a more grounding place. It seems like your personality is more maternal, mm -hmm. um, nurturing, supportive, where hers is like, let's have fun together. Um, and so what bond you guys might not just be in alignment anymore. Um, okay. And that's I guess, okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And that's okay. You just have to come to terms with, um, you, you can have a conversation with her about this. Mm -hmm. You just can't have the conversation expecting to change her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can only get her to see how, how you feel and why you feel that way. She might not agree, but she might. You can say, I would love if when I reach out to you, you reciprocate the way that I do to you. She may or she may not. Mm -hmm. So with expectations, I didn't get further in, but when we set expectations, when we do have expectations, we can express expectations. It is totally okay to have expectations in relationships, but we have to express them. <clears throat> okay. We have to be mind read. We have to express them. And then, and only then, can we get upset if they're agreed upon expectations? Okay. Okay. If they're not agreed upon, we can't get mad. I mean, we might get mad, but yet you don't have the right, so to speak, to get mad. And okay. so, <clears throat> I probably should have said that earlier about expectations. We can have expectations when we express them. So as a boss, I have to express expectations to my team. My team has to agree upon them. Or not. If someone says no, I might think that that person's not in alignment with the team anymore and maybe they don't belong there anymore. Mm -hmm. Same thing in a relationship, whether it's an intimate relationship or a friendship. You know, when I first started dating my, my boyfriend, this is like three and a half years ago, he was very much into like, he had been married and then divorced and he was very much in like the new divorce, I'm 25 again mindset out all the time, guys weekends, like every other weekend, it was crazy. And I said to him, listen, I don't know like who you were dating before me, but this is totally not okay with me. And he's like, what do you, you can't change me. And I'm like, oh, I'm not trying to change you. I'm literally just saying this is not okay with me. So you can go on living this way, but I expect a different type of relationship from my life and where I am right now. So you can go on being you. But my expectation for me is to be in a relationship that's a partnership that I feel safe and loved in and going out with my partner, not my partner needing guys nights every night of the week. So uh, we actually wound up breaking up for a little bit and he needed to process that because that was like we, what you're trying to control. His instinct was you're trying to control me. And the reality was, I wasn't. I was stating my expectations for myself and my life. Mm -hmm. You can meet them or you cannot meet them. That's your choice. And that's the freedom that we, it's, it's like full on Buddhism right there. Letting people have the space, like don't pick the flower, just look at the flower, water the flower. You can't pick the flower. Um, so for your friend, I would literally say, I'm you know, feeling like this relationship is maybe a little lopsided. And I'm feeling disappointed because when I feel like when I reach out to you, you don't respond and, and I don't hear from you. And then when you need something, uh, I feel there's an urgency to respond or you get upset and I could be crazy. Always throw in the like, I could be crazy. I could be making this up. 
I could be making it into something that's not. What is your point of view? Because I love you and I really want this friendship to be its best capacity, mm -hmm. but, I, but I just don't know if we're on the same page right now. And by the way, speaking of capacities, this is another really big lesson. Everyone has a different capacity of each emotion. And this is a mind blowing thing when you, when you get it, it's actually fascinating. Everyone has a different capacity for a different emotion. So my dad, I'll give a consistent example here. As I said, if I expected my dad to come open the door and give me a big hug and say, oh, I'm so proud of you, would be crazy. I was mad at him for so long, but what I realized is my dad was actually loving me at his 100% capacity of love. He was literally loving me at his 100% capacity. Now, in comparison, that's like my 5% capacity. But how can I expect someone to love more than their 100% capacity? That's powerful, yeah. So crazy, right? Yeah. So everyone has a different capacity. So your friend could be loving you at her capacity right now in the way that maybe, I don't know, like all the backstory of her, but maybe that's like, maybe she's busy with life in a way because something's going on that her capacity to be still even her capacity for people to rely on her might be minimal right now. And our capacity can always expand. It also can always constrict. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. it's going yeah. to Yeah. What's yeah. that? I said, this makes a lot of sense. It's like really fascinating and it makes sense because it's almost like, I know she has a lot of stuff going on, but before she was able to like call me because like we would have like check-ins and now she's like totally stopped. So I'm just like, her capacity is full. And I, I know she like loves me, but it's just like, anytime she needs me, I have to be like there. So I'm kind of like, I love her and I'm really compassionate about her, but I need to realize like she can't do more than she like can handle right now. But you also have to create your own, clarify your own expectations. Yeah. Again, she doesn't have to agree upon them. Right. And you have to live within the expectation of yourself. Mm -hmm. And you also have to <clears throat> create boundaries, right? So if you feel like the relationship is too one-sided and is abusive, abusive, like not that she's mean to you, but abusive that she's taking an advantage of you, mm -hmm. then that's a boundary that you have to create. Like, listen, you can't call me at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. Because I, if I called you at 3 a.m., I don't think you're going to answer the phone. Mm -hmm. and maybe she would. I'm, when I say be compassionate, understanding it, and respect somebody, where they're at, it does not mean at all to diminish who you are, what you need, or your own worth or value, ever. Like going back to that example with Steve, like I literally said, I don't want this, I don't want a guy that's like this. Mm -hmm. You could go do whatever you want. This is my expectation for my self-respect and the value that I know I'm worth. You can choose to rise to the occasion or you, don't that's up to you so never diminish your own worth in being compassionate and understanding for somebody else's limitation either okay that makes sense that, that does and you know what we've never actually discussed expectations like me and her have never discussed expectations and i think that's why there's a disconnect and a misunderstanding so Do i think what? yeah most people don't ever which is why most people have problems in so many of their relationships. Mm -hmm. It would be amazing if somebody, if everyone walked around and gave their playbook to each other. Here's my playbook. Here's my expectations. Here's what triggers me. Here's what makes me happy. Here's my love language. Like if we all just gave our playbook, we'd all be okay. Yeah. Uh, but thank you, Jen. Yeah, this was really, really great feedback. So this is really helpful in, in how I can respond. <laughs> You're welcome. This is like one of my favorite parts of the class when I take real life situations and I help. Yeah. Maneuver them. That's awesome. But thank you for sharing. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? Comments? Questions? Comments? Well, this was fun. We hung out for three and a half hours.
I loved it. It felt like not three and a half hours to me. I hope it didn't feel like it to you either. Um, so I hope you're all going to bed tonight with a lot to process. Um, and it's funny, it takes a few days for you to process and like put it into mindset of, of things that you're working on. Remember, that's why I asked you in the beginning, the things that you wanna work on the most, the relationships, the aspects of your life, so that you can take what we're learning and correlate it back to that. Um, makes sense, hopefully. So um, again, for those of you who signed up for that extra 30 minutes, I will place in the group, <clears throat> in the Facebook group tomorrow, a Calendly that you can just plug into. Um, and uh, I will continue to post a couple other resources in there as well. And any of you who want to do something more in February, just let me know. Um, I think it's like, it's Monday nights, February like 18th or something um, is when it begins. So this is an ongoing practice and study. Oh, one other thing everyone asks me all the time is what other stuff can you read to learn this stuff? And, and I don't, and I'm not being mean and judgmental. I'm just telling you the truth of my observation. Any emotional intelligence book on the shelf right now is literally only talking from psychology versus the interconnectivity of all these disciplines. So this teaches nutrition, physiology, psychology, emotional intelligence, neuroscience, metaphysics, and quantum physics, literally all rolled up into one, intersecting how do you become the best version of yourself from all these disciplines. The emotional intelligence books are literally teaching you the psychology of the framework of emotional intelligence, more about thinking empathy versus being empathetic, very different. There's one thing to think it and then another thing to be it. So Buddhism was the thing that gave me clarity to all emotional intelligence because Buddhism is not a religion really, it's more so a way of being. Uh, <clears throat> It is literally the art of compassion, kindness, empathy, understanding, the art of letting go, and um, the art of transcending pain. So the best things to read are actually Buddhism books, like Buddhist boot camp, which I hand out to people like candy, because it's like the point of entry of simplicity to teach people emotional intelligence. Um, <clears throat> Anything from the Dalai Lama, the art of happiness is huge, but it's totally worth it. Uh, videos, I watch videos on Buddhism all the time. Um, I have one I actually, I'll post actually when we hang up because I just posted it in another group yesterday. But um, there's a one uh, monk that I really love. His name is Tit Not Pun. So it's T. H I C H I believe. Hold on, I didn't get the correct spelling. It's a tricky one. I don't think it's a basic one that you guys are going to easily search. Um, if you Google his name in Oprah, you'll see an awesome video uh, right out of the gate. So it's T oh, it's right. T H I C H. Second word N H A T. Third word H A N H. He's one of my favorites. There's a lot of other good ones too, but you can start with him. And what I love about YouTube is it always suggests like-minded similar things. So you can usually follow the path from there. But Google his name and Oprah and you'll see an awesome video, uh, awesome interview she did with him many years ago. Well, all right, ladies, thank you so much. I had so much fun and I will post in the group and i will be talking to most of you all uh, soon more more soon more soon <laughs> thank you so much have a great night everyone thank you Bye. oh and by the way i read everyone's comments even though i didn't say them out loud so thank you i was reading them the whole time <laughs>